morning. Can I welcome members of the press and public to the 10th uh, meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015? Uh, can I first of all ask all those present to ensure that their electronic items are switched to flight mode uh, so they do not affect the work of the committee? The colleagues of agenda item number one, uh, which is the decision to take items six and seven in private, do have agreement? Agreed. Okay. Agenda item number two is accountability, audit, and the further devolution of powers. Uh, and the first substantive item on our agenda is evidence from the Scottish Government uh, on the accountability audit arrangements for the proposed further devolution of powers to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, there is written submissions received on this issue have been provided to members. Uh, I'd like to remind members uh, and witnesses that we are tight for time this morning, uh, and I'd appreciate short uh, and succinct answers to questions and uh, also to uh, answers at the same time. I'm delighted to welcome John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy, uh, Stephen Sadler, uh, Team Leader of Elections and Constitution Division, and Aileen Wright, uh, Deputy Director of Finance and Scottish Government. Uh, I understand the Cabinet Secretary has a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I will. I welcome the opportunity to discuss the audit and accountability arrangements for the further devolution of powers following from the recommendations of the Smith Commission. As I indicated in my letter of the 5th of May, it will be important that appropriate and robust arrangements are put in place to support the new powers and responsibilities and allow the Scottish Parliament and its committees to hold to account those who collect or spend money, public money in Scotland. This committee's consideration of what these arrangements should look like is, timely, is as timely as it is important as we await the publication of the UK Government's Scotland Bill later this week. More work will be required in the coming months to develop audit and accountability arrangements at the same time as we discuss and develop the detailed proposals to devolve the powers themselves. Since the publication of the draft clauses, we have been working with the United Kingdom Government to ensure that the Scotland Bill delivers the substance and the spirit of the Smith Commission. We have offered comments across a range of subjects covered with the aim of developing legislation that the Scottish Government can support. There is, however, some uh, way to go to achieve that, and the recent report from the Devolution of Further Powers Committee concluded that while the draft clauses achieved their aim in some cases, in other areas they fell short. Once we see the bill, we will be able to assess how far the UK Government has taken on board the range of comments received since January. We will also have a firmer basis on which to, found, uh, to, to, to take forward the work to develop the necessary audit and accountability arrangements. The transfer of powers to be delivered through the Scotland Bill will have implications for a range of organisations who will in future be accountable to the Scottish Parliament. The work to put in place appropriate arrangements to reflect this development will need to continue alongside the parliamentary consideration of the Bill's proposals, both at, both at Westminster and in this Parliament. This Committee's consideration of these issues and the eventual report will help to ensure that the UK Government and the bodies concerned give them the prominence and the attention that they deserve. And the Scottish Government's approach will be to ensure that the arrangements put in place for audit and reporting must enable this Parliament to scrutinise satisfactorily the use of the transferred powers and what is spent on them. We will take a pragmatic view, seeking to build on existing experience of what works well. Uh, that view will be informed by the comments of this committee and, of course, Audit Scotland. It will be important that whatever the specific arrangements for individual bodies, they are clear, consistent and transparent in terms of responsibilities and reporting. Where bodies have an established relationship with government, there will be existing frameworks for accountability and audit. Where it is clear that these arrangements work, we will, uh, we will work to build on, on them in a proportionate way that provides efficient and effective accountability whilst minimising additional burdens. Where new requirements arise, the government will prepare um, will prepare these uh, to ensure that appropriate arrangements are in place to establish effective scrutiny in partnership with the committee. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. And can I thank the Minister for his contribution. Uh, before I open up to other members, can I uh, raise with the Minister specifics uh, in relation to, and one particular example, the BBC, uh, who will now have uh, reporting arrangements that should be put in place, particularly in relation to audit, uh, to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, I just wonder how the uh, Minister envisages this uh, particular uh, process to be followed. Essentially, the um, command paper indicates that uh, the BBC would be required to lay its annual report uh, and accounts before the Scottish Parliament. Um, and 
submit reports to and appear before committees of the Parliament um, in the same way as it does through the United Kingdom Parliament. Um, I think providing the presentation of those accounts it provides um, clear and satisfactory information that enables um, this committee and other committees of Parliament to determine the degree to which the BBC's operations uh, within Scotland can be fully and properly identified from that process and can be accordingly scrutinised, uh, I think those arrangements are, are broadly satisfactory. But it will depend, crucially, on the degree to which that information um, um, reflects the activities of the BBC in Scotland and, thereafter the, and therefore the ability of committees to scrutinise that activity. And I would envisage this being taken forward um, in a memorandum of understanding between the respective governments, Parliament and the BBC. And can I just ask the Minister what discussions have taken place with uh, BBC in this respect and are there any elements of that which you could make public today? Um, the discussions on, on this and on a range of subjects um, will have been taking place at a government-to-government -government level so far. Um, obviously, we are dependent on seeing the clauses that come from the UK government in their final form before we can then begin to take forward some of the detailed follow-up discussions that will be required. But there will be a necessity for discussion uh, with the BBC in that respect, and I would expect that to take, uh, to, to take its course once the, uh, the, the clauses are available to us in full, which we expect on Thursday. Tom Beattie. Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, a number of organisations, for example Ofcom, Ofcom have uh, identified that uh, they have a reporting requirement for their annual accounts, which is set out in legislation and is subject to direction from UK ministers. What are your views on whether the Scottish ministers or the Scottish Parliament should be consulted before any such directions are given by UK ministers? And should any consultation requirement within that be actually set out in statute? The Smith Commission report uh, provides for an organisation like Ofcom uh, the provision for the Scottish Parliament to, uh, and the Scottish Government to contribute towards the formulation of the uh, setting of the strategic guidance of an organisation such as Ofcom. Um, so, uh, obviously, we, we will wish to utilise that, um, that access to the full to ensure that Ofcom is particularly well cited on the requirements and the needs of people within Scotland. And if I give the committee an example of this, I met the Chief Executive of Ofcom of um, just the other week there, and I was making the point to um, Sharon White that, um, <coughs> for example, on broadband, um, it is all very well for Ofcom to tick a box which says 97% um, of the United Kingdom population have access to broadband. But if that three per the 3% that doesn't have access to broadband is fundamentally located in rural Scotland, um, it's about as much use as a chocolate teapot. So the importance that I attach to the dialogue that the Scottish Government can have with organisations like Ofcom in ensuring that their strategic direction properly and fully reflects the needs of people in Scotland um, will be an important uh, responsibility for us to have. And, there, and, there, and, and as a consequence, I think it's also important that parliamentary committees are able to hold Ofcom to account on some of these tests to establish whether or not uh, an organisation like Ofcom is properly and fully um, taking into account the needs and the requirements of people in Scotland, which is what I think the Smith Commission provision of enabling the Scottish Government to have access to, um, this, to the formulation of strategic guidance for an organisation like Ofcom uh, had in mind when, when this issue was considered. Has any analysis been done by the Scottish Government uh, to determine whether uh, further UK legislative change will be required in order for the annual reports and the, the accounts of bodies identified in the draft clauses to include with Scottish-specific expenditure and performance information? The, that, that will essentially be the responsibility of the United Kingdom government, and I would expect that to be reflected. Any provision of that nature, I would expect to see reflected in the draft clauses that come from the UK government. 
Just looking at the, the evidence that's been submitted from Citizens Advice Scotland, I was noticing that they highlighted uh, the question uh, in, in relation to DWP and uh, universal credit and so forth, and obviously the benefits that we hope that uh, will come to the Scottish Parliament. They highlight the fact that uh, the process, as they say, doesn't seem to be equitable. Um, they're highlighting the fact that the clauses require the Scottish Government to consult the UK Government and to gain their agreement on the timing of any variance. However, the UK Government, wish, if the UK Government wishes to make regulations, they, they have no, uh, they're, they're required to consult the Scottish Ministers, but they're not required to gain their agreement. It, it doesn't seem a very equitable partnership agreement, that. The issues that um, has been material to the consideration of the draft clauses that were published in January, because the, uh, the, the draft clause in this respect places a requirement on the Scottish Government to be able to secure the agreement of the United Kingdom Secretary of State for particular changes that we would wish to make, but there is not the, as Mr Beattie correctly says, there isn't the um, any reciprocal uh, obligation on the United Kingdom Secretary of State. Now that um, clearly gives the ability to a United Kingdom Secretary of State to withhold consent. So there isn't actually um, in that scenario uh, a proper and full devolution of responsibility because there still remains some ability of the UK government to say well, no, we're not going to allow that to happen for whatever reason is the case. Uh, so that's one of the material issues that we have been raising with the United Kingdom government. It was one of the substantive points of concern we had when the draft clauses were announced in January. Um, and we have sustained that point with the United Kingdom government. And we will await the publication of the Scotland Bill to see if the UK government have amended that in any way, which I think is necessary for the Smith Commission to be properly put into practice. What if I could just go back to the, the BBC? I'm sorry for uh, jumping around. Um, we did receive a very short submission from the BBC Trust, um, which stated, our expectation is that the BBC will provide exactly the same annual report and accounts to be laid in the Scottish Parliament as is laid in Westminster. Um, and by contrast, BBC Alba provides an annual report and accounts, indicates its progress against objectives uh, and outcomes, information on corporate government, uh, governance, uh, etc. So, um, exactly the same report as is currently laid at Westminster, is that acceptable in terms of appropriate and uh, robust arrangements for the BBC, or would you be looking for something more in line with what BBC Alba currently produces? In my earlier answer to the convener, um, I indicated that um, the, the, the process of uh, laying a report before Parliament to, seemed to me to be an acceptable um, approach. But what uh, is essential in that judgment is what information that report conveys and what opportunity it provides for Parliament to properly scrutinise the activities of the BBC in Scotland. So I think the points that um, Mary Scanlon raises about the um, the, 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 the comparison between the contents of the approach of BBC Alba and um, the BBC in general, uh, I think, uh, is a welcome comparison. And I think a, a fuller amount of information uh, to enable committees of this parliament to properly scrutinise the, the, the activities of the BBC would be required. So the, the, the contents of the submission from the, um, the BBC uh, in my opinion, would need to be uh, developed to take into account legitimate desires uh, on the part of this committee and others to properly scrutinise the BBC. So you would be looking for an annual report that wasn't just the same as the one laid at Westminster, but one that uh, allowed this committee and this parliament to more meaningfully uh, scrutinise matters relating to Scotland uh, and also... Uh, on the annual BBC Scotland Manage Review, re, Review Report. So what I'm really saying is the submission we've got today from Rona Fairhead, the chairman of the BBC Trust, 
it would not be sufficient simply to do what they're doing just now. We would need something much more focused on Scotland uh, um, for the future, something more akin to what BBC Alba are producing. I think that's a, that, that's a fair summary, and I think the, the, the submission from Rona Fairhead is not in my view, the last word on this subject, because there is a memorandum of understanding has yet to be created, uh, discussed, scrutinised, yeah. tested, and out of that process, I would expect the type of issues that Mary Scanlon has, has fairly raised to be properly taken into account. Thank you. I could um, <coughs> ask the Deputy First Minister firstly about the Marine and Coast Guard Agency. The Government's own submission makes a couple of um, observations about uh, separating out the MCA's expenditure in Scotland, which I thought were fair remarks. Um, I wonder, Mr Swinney, if you've had it, uh, given any further thought to how that could best be done so that Government and, of course, Parliament could properly scrutinise that, exactly that area. What, what we've, I, think the, I think to be fair to the MCA, I think their, their initial response was very much an, an initial response, and we, we've now had some subsequent discussion with the MCA um, on behalf of my officials have taken that forward uh, to try to um, uh, advance these issues and, and the MCA submission of course predates the Scottish Government's submission uh, or communication with the committee. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, uh, I would be um, optimistic that we'll get to a much um, better position where more information that uh, can be made available that better captures the distinct, the distinct and discrete activities of the MCA within Scotland and therefore enables committees to properly and fully consider all of the implications mm. of those issues. And I think um, in this respect, I think the committee has got uh, a significant role to specify what type of information the committee believes would be appropriate for the committee to have at its disposal. Um, and uh, clearly, um, the, the, the Public Audit Committee is in a, a, a particular position that can uh, to advance some of those, um, those issues and those points uh, across a range of different organisations of which the MC would be one. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> without getting drawn into the policy areas, which uh, aren't our direct responsibility, and you've reflected on Smith, uh, Smith Agreement as well in this context, um, there may be, for example, areas or for involving co-location with other blue light emergency services in Scotland, which would make eminent sense. Um, is that the kind of area that you envisage the government being involved in? I appreciate that won't be a direct matter for, for a parliamentary committee, but since you've got the fire board sitting behind you, that's the kind of thing I've been thinking about a lot of late. Yeah. And, and I think there are these are, of course, the, the policy opportunities that arise out of having greater, um, greater scope to influence some of these agendas. Yes. But I think it comes back to the crucial point as to whether or not the bodies are prepared to consider some of these opportunities. Mm. If I go back to the example I cited with Mr Beatty about, um, about Ofcom, it, it is appropriate that organisations like Ofcom, with the, you know, if, the Scottish, if the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament are being accorded an opportunity to influence the strategic mm. direction of these organisations, as mm. Mr Scott will be entirely familiar with from the Smith Commission, that has to be for a purpose. Absolutely. That is yeah. to get these organisations to take greater account of the particular and specific requirements within Scotland. So the broadband example to Mr Beattie fits into that category. The point that Mr Scott has raised about the MCA is particularly relevant given the extent of coastline that we have, the extent of maritime interest that we have, and frankly the extent of risk mm. that, that is more that is disproportionately carried in Scottish waters, with which Mr Scott will be entirely familiar from his constituency interest. Um, so I think there is, um, the, the, there is an opportunity for us to shape um, imaginative ways of delivering public policy if there is an opportunity to properly use that strategic input in the way that the Smith Commission envisaged would be the case. Uh, thank you. I agree with that. Um, can I ask two rather brief questions, Convener? The first is about the Crown Estate. Um, the Government's submission makes um, um, some 
um, interesting remarks about the continuing Crown Estate. From an audit point of view, uh, it would be for this committee and indeed for government to properly scrutinise what that might be. Has uh, the Deputy First Minister wished to share his emerging thoughts on the best way in which the continuing activities of the Crown Estate uh, might uh, be properly scrutinised from an audit perspective? I'm, 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 I'm anxious about trading into the to the use of the term continuing. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering where Mr. Scott is trying to take me here. I, I, the, no, I think there's a real uncertainty here about what is, you know, when I signed up to the Smith Commission report, you know, I felt I was signing up to the full devolution of the Crown Estate and all of its interests to Scotland. I, I was, that was what was in my mind. And we now have this point emerging that the Crown Estate may do that, but then may also do other things, which then opens up another front of Crown Estate activity in Scotland. And I'm, I really think this is... Uh, well, Mr Scott's heard my evidence to the Devolution of Further Powers Committee on this point. I, I think this is... A, 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 at best, it's confusing. At worst, it's, it's actually undermining the whole principle that the Smith Commission signed up to. Whatever happens, so, so I'm, 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 I'm just a little bit reluctant to accept at this stage that there is a proper continuing role for the Crown Estate beyond the devolution of the Crown Estate responsibility to Scotland. In whatever shape or form the Crown Estate um, emerges, what I do believe is that uh, the, this committee and other committees must be able to properly and effectively scrutinise Crown Estate activities in Scotland in a fashion that has not been the case to date. And I, I think the devolution of responsibilities brings that more into the scope of this Parliament and therefore places particular obligations on the Crown Estate specific in relation to this committee and what this committee can undertake to, um, to clarify for members of the public the, the issues about which members of the public will be concerned. Here this week, of course, we will, we will see. A final question, Kavina. Can I go back to the chocolate teapot analogy uh, that the Deputy First Minister used with some aplomb uh, earlier on? It would also be open, to, of course, to his government to say on the 3%, in which I entirely agree with him, that government policy could change so as to encourage exactly... I mean, I know this is... A, forgive me, this is... Um, encourage exactly that to happen, because, as he knows from his own constituency, as I do from mine, there are people who are not going to be caught by the current government policy, which is a UK-Scottish joint policy. But in the audit of that, and that's, of course, something that Audit Scotland have done. Um, it could be that the policy was specifically targeted on those areas. Ofcom, of course, are part of that, but government is too. Would that be fair? Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the government... You know, I, th I think I've been pretty clear about the government's intention here, that we believe that the rollout of superfast broadband is an absolutely essential requirement for all localities in Scotland, yeah. regardless of where they are and how difficult they are to Indeed. reach. And, and, and Mr Scott has extensive experience of the, the challenges and difficulties in this respect um, around the country. And, uh, I, you know, I, I am very, very keen to ensure that that commitment is fulfilled. It will be more easy for us to fulfil if there is a greater obligation placed on, on providers. Yeah. And I, and I can't do that because I don't have legislative competence to do that, yeah. but I do intend to use the strategic opportunity of dialogue with Ofcom to advance those arguments. Now, yeah. that is not me in any way trying to pass the buck. That is me properly trying to use the constitutional settlement to ensure that we have more extensive coverage of superfast broadband by virtue of the obligation that is placed on providers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, Yes, there is an opportunity for, um, for the Scottish Government to influence that process and the Chief Executive of Ofcom, if she was in front of you today, I think would, would, would be very clear to the committee that she left St Andrew's House knowing that the Scottish Government attaches mm -hmm. the greatest of importance mm -hmm. to superfast broadband being available mm -hmm. right across the country. And Ofcom <coughs> has a critical role in ensuring that the obligations placed on operators and providers is, 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 is set within that context. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs>
Uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, your comments earlier regarding the MCA and the uh, Crown Estate I think have been, certainly have been helpful. Uh, just but on the Crown Estate, uh, once again, just to, uh, have there been any, f any further discussions uh, regarding the, the, the two Crown Estate uh, solution uh, that, uh, that yourself or officials have, have been involved in with uh, the UK Government in terms of the, the potential accountability uh, situation uh, going forward? Officials have um, been involved in discussions around the substance of the implementation of, of the taking forward of the clauses uh, on the Crown Estate. Um, so yes, those issues have been explored again with United Kingdom uh, government officials. Um, in relation to the accountability issues, um, th there has been no further discussion on that because essentially a number of these points in detail will await the finalisation of the clauses that emerge and we'll, you know, we're in a position I haven't seen as yet a full um, uh, outline of the clauses that will be published uh, later this week. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm sure certainly that's something that uh, the committee, uh, this committee will probably kind of want to come back to um, at some further point on, the, on that particular area. Um, uh, the second question is regarding the COSLA's submission. Uh, and they suggested that uh, it might be appropriate for certain other bodies to actually submit uh, focused uh, reports uh, on specified issues, and one of which uh, was on the, the Gambling Commission regarding the, uh, the, the, the transfer of some of the powers regarding the fixed odds betting terminals. Um, do you think that, uh, that this actually would be useful for, for this Parliament's uh, auditing and accountability processes to have uh, some of these uh, organisations to, to report to this Parliament? I, I think the, there is a case for it, because if there is an, ap if there is an appetite of, for inquiry within this Parliament on whatever question, I think the Parliament should pursue its legitimate inquiries. We may not hold all of the responsibilities in that respect, but it's, it's not stopped Parliament exercising what is, I think, an, an entirely legitimate democratic right to probe and to scrutinise on any question. So I think um, committees should be free to take that forward. I think there becomes, um, I think what might limit that is the, well, the statute of the, the establishment of this parliament and the ability of committees to uh, command evidence, uh, which are from my recollection of Section 23.1 of the Scotland Act, is, uh, is not departing me. It's a pretty formidable power that Parliament has to uh, require information to be brought before it. So I think there's a, um, there is a, undoubtedly a case for that to be, to, to be made. Uh, has uh, yourself or officials from the Scottish Government um, put this particular case forward to the UK Government uh, on regarding whether it's uh, the Gambling Commission or uh, other examples such as the FCA, uh, the Health and Safety Executive and the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission? We, we, in my answer to um, one of the earlier questions that uh, Mr Millen raised, I, I indicated that uh, a lot of the discussion about accountability and scrutiny arrangements would have to follow the definition of the final clauses and that's essentially a Early discussions have taken place around some of the accountability issues, but I think there's a long way for us to go on, on, the, on these points. And I reiterate the point I made to, earlier on to Mr Scott, that I think it's important that this committee um, specifies the, you know, many of the terms of what it believes to be um, the appropriate and acceptable level of information to be available to the Parliament to enable this committee and other committees of Parliament to properly exercise their functions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning again, good morning. Deputy First Minister. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just briefly uh, see what your thoughts are on, on what I think of the th as the third leg of, of audits. I mean, the first leg is plainly just making sure the numbers add up. The second is making sure that the governance is there. But the third to me is ensuring that we have data which enables us to work out how effective an organisation is, whether it's actually doing what you want it to do and, and, and how efficiently and effectively it's doing that. Um, I appreciate that it's very early days simply because of the things that you've probably spoken about and, and bills that are about to appear. But I wonder whether you could give us any thoughts as to how you see 
these other organisations which we're not going to have a greater interest in actually accounting to us for their effectiveness? The, I suppose the, these issues fall into, into two categories. I, if there is a, a responsibility that is transferring to the Scottish Parliament, which in its entirety, I, my view would be that the existing arrangements of the Scottish Parliament through the Public Finance and Accountability Act and the arrangements that uh, that Act provides for, which are of course the basis upon which we undertake um, our audit and scrutiny work at the present moment, uh, these arrangements should be applied to any responsibility transferring in full uh, to the Scottish Parliament and under our competence, because these arrangements work well, they are viewed to be um, of a great strength and in international standing and um, we should therefore apply them as we apply them to the current day-to-day -day arrangements in which are the, the meat and drink of this committee's uh, work. I think where there is a shared responsibility, we have to take care to ensure that the committee is properly able to um, have available the information that will allow it to satisfy itself of the, um, the, the, the authority, the governance and the effectiveness of, the, um, of all of the public expenditure that is being undertaken within Scotland by these bodies. Now, some of that will involve, I think, a greater degree of joint working between the Auditor General, in, the Auditor -General for Scotland and the controller and auditor general for, um, uh, I presume, England and Wales, or maybe the United Kingdom, I suppose the United Kingdom. Um, so that will be a, a, an area where I think a lot more joint activity is going to have to be undertaken because the, um, this committee has to be satisfied that um, it has access to proper information that challenges and scrutinises that activity uh, without us having um, essentially two separate exercises having to be undertaken, which I think would be difficult to justify and also difficult to, um, well, difficult, difficult to provide, I think, and difficult to interrogate. So I think that, um, so I think I would, I would fit the, the, my answer to Mr Don's question into those two categories. Where something is transferring in its entirety to the Scottish Parliament, PFA Act requirements should be applied. And where there's some form of shared endeavour, DWP activities, some of these um, type of activities, then I think there has to be some um, substantive response to that requirement from the UK body. And that has to involve some a greater degree of involvement for the Auditor General in the process. Thank you. I, do, do you sense that the UK government understands the point that you've just made and will push the National Audit Office to, to work with the Auditor General for Scotland? I, I, well, from, from time to time I encounter elements of the United Kingdom government that don't seem to be particularly aware of devolved arrangements. Mm -hmm. So it's by no means a complete process. Um, so I think there will be a challenge to get these, these issues and these questions more widely understood and therefore reflected in, in practice. I'm not also, to be, to be fair to the United Kingdom government, I'm not altogether sure it's their obligation to push the NEO in that direction. I think it's perhaps for the NEO to realise that the world, the landscape has changed and it has to ensure that there is a, a way of working with the Auditor General for Scotland and Audit Scotland in a fashion that enables information to be um, for work to be undertaken and information to be presented in a, in a fashion that enables Parliament to properly discharge its functions. Thank you. That suggests maybe we need to talk to the Auditor General about her working relationship I, I think, with... I think, that, that, that's, I think that's, that's, that's the appropriate conversation. Uh, yeah, I'm grateful. Thank you. Ms. Gannon. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sure you've uh, 
Well, I hope you'll agree with me that it is quite difficult sort of second-guessing what is in this Queen's speech and indeed the legislation that is likely to be published tomorrow. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland has listened uh, to feedbacks and uh, has also said that he's very open to amendments to the Scotland Bill. So uh, I look forward to that. But there's uh, so many devolved issues under Smith that it is quite difficult just to look at one. And I thank my colleagues for the, the general ones. But perhaps if I could just pick out one that, to be fair, your government has been very critical of, uh, and that is the, the work programme. Um, now, that's... Uh, a new economic power under the Smith um, Commission proposals. How will you measure the uh, employment programmes in Scotland when they are fully devolved? What sort of auditing and accounting arrangements, what sort of outcomes would you be looking for in order to ensure that uh, money is well spent and we get value for money? I'd be looking at the ability of these employment programmes to ensure that um, individuals were supported into sustained employment and that that uh, employment was um, sustained on a basis that was acceptable to the Scottish Government. Would be what would be one of would be essentially the central outcome of an employment service programme. Um, and uh, obviously we would have a range of other key indicators that uh, would uh, determine the basis of that, the relative cost of that, uh, and the performance of any providers in supporting us in that respect, in the way that we have a whole range of key performance indicators that apply to um, the work of Skills Development Scotland, for example, on um, modern apprenticeships, uh, or to a programme um, such as um, the, the, the Youth Employment Scotland programme, uh, which SCVO take forward? Well, at the moment, people are uh, supported for up to two years and they, you know, back into employment and while they're in employment. So would you be continuing that same level of support on a similar basis as to what's... Uh, provided just now? Well, these are, these, are, these are questions the government would have to determine in, in, in policy terms. And of course, one of my concerns about this whole area of policy is that our ability to do this um, will take a great deal longer than any of us who sat in the Smith Commission could have envisaged. Um, I sat on the Smith Commission between um, September and November 2010. And during that, and as we are having a discussion about um, devolving employment services at the earliest possible opportunity to the Scottish Government, the United Kingdom Government was renewing the contracts of existing employment arrang support arrangements which will ensure that we cannot uh, exercise devolved responsibility before 2017, which is a position which the Scottish Government um, deeply regrets. Clarify for the record, uh, just the official report, Smith Commission 2014. What did I say? I think it says 2010. I just wanted to... 2014, my apologies. I think that was Calman. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, well, thankfully, I never sat in the Calman Commission. Um, well, the, the point is that in two years' time, it will be fully devolved and, and you will make the changes. But do the basic principles still apply that the employment programme will help uh, long-term and short-term unemployed uh, people and give them the support to get back into the work environment. Uh, would the same principles apply? Well, well, of, of, of course, the, the, you know, there'd be no point in an employment programme if it wasn't about getting people back into employment. That would be the, the core purpose of an employment programme. But I think the issues that I'm concerned about um, in the short term are the fact that um, the Smith Commission envisaged this power being devolved early and it's now going to be devolved late. And secondly, that I don't think there is um, the comprehensive scope for um, devolution or exercising devolved control over employment services that, um, uh, that I would like to see being in place. Yeah, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that one. Uh, my second... Can I just sorry. clarify, though, just be careful we don't stay into policy areas because the yeah, committee's, that, committee's yeah. business is, is 
primarily on audit arrangements. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the second uh, very brief question is from the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountability, SIPFA. Uh, they previously recommended the development of a Scottish balance sheet to provide overall context administration of the financial affairs of the devolved administration. Is that reasonable? And is that uh, something you're looking at going forward? We, we have, um, I think, very comprehensive information that is gathered and published on the public finances of Scotland and the resources under contr the control of the Scottish Parliament. And what certainly I, you know, I, I think that information is uh, sufficiently comprehensive and what we will look to do with the further devolved responsibilities is essentially to ensure that that uh, comprehensive standard is reflected in the uh, arrangements we put in place for the presentation of um, financial information about the performance of public expenditure and the, the work of the Scottish Government. The equivalent to a Scottish balance sheet? But I, 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 I don't know quite what uh, what, what information is required here? Um, we have, you know, the government produces uh, all of the necessary financial information about the conduct of public expenditure in Scotland. Um, so, from from where I'm sitting, that is a comprehensive uh, explanation of the position. I'm not quite sure what uh, further would be required to satisfy okay. the point made I'm by Mr. Scanlon. I'm the weeks and months ahead they'll make. Uh, this will become clearer. And my final question, I've actually asked you this question in the chamber at oral questions and uh, I did get a very constructive answer, but it's about the Crown Estate. Uh, there seems to be uh, an understanding that the Crown Estate is only responsible for the shoreline around Scotland. There are actually 36 tenant farmers in Murray and Glenlivet who are very worried about uh, the devolved uh, Crown Estate. So if I can just say, um, the Scottish Government takes a view that the organisation that takes over the Crown Estate should report to the Parliament. This should include performance, financial information and the contribution made to the National Performance Framework. I'm just asking, does this fit, you know, are the farmers going to be accountable to a minister in the Parliament or as Cosla said, we need to ensure the Smith Commission's recommendations are acted on in full by ensuring the Crown Estate operations and associated revenues are fully devolved to local government. Now, having spoken to many of the 36 tenant farmers, many of the tenancies have come down generations, they're a bit worried uh, about councillors or ministers uh, being managing their farm activities. So I wonder if you, I appreciate there's evidence being taken at the Rural Affairs Committee on this issue today, but I wonder if you can bring any comfort to the Glenlivet and Murray farmers. Uh, I don't think, I'm not aware that any government or council has ever controlled or managed farms. Can you give me any comfort about how you see the auditing and accounting arrangements uh, notwithstanding the shoreline, but focusing on the 36 farms? Um, there's a, a multiplicity of issues in here. Um, I think the, the, on the audit... I, well, I know, I know I'm yeah. absolutely... I'm very much aware of that point, and, yeah. and um, uh, my colleague, the Rural Affairs Secretary, Richard Lockhead, has, uh, who represents the area, has made that, yeah. uh, that point very clearly. Um, in our discussions about uh, these issues. Um, I think the... Can I separate a, a, a couple of the points in there? On the audit and accountability arrangements, um, the, the, these will be about the activities of the Crown Estate. And needless to say, some of the individual farmers will have a relationship with that in the sense that they will be paying... Um, they will be paying uh, rent to the Crown Estate. So in... in in that respect, there has to be um, transparency around the activities of the Crown Estate, which I would expect Parliament to want to exercise, but around the Crown Estate, not around the activities of individual farmers. And I, I cannot envisage there being any appetite for 
the government to, and this is my point of reassurance to the, the farmers of Glenlivet, I cannot see any, there being any appetite within government uh, to try to um, in any way direct the work or role of tenant farmers in any respect. I just cannot see why on earth that would be. You know, these are people who, as Mrs Scanlon quite rightly says, have, have come through uh, generations of involvement in this, the, the nurture and the care and the stewardship of some magnificent parts of Scotland and what the government would know that was more about those activities than the tenant farmers of Glenlivet uh, you know, wouldn't be worth knowing. So I, 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 think that, I really don't think there's any cause for concern here, but uh, I do assure um, uh, those individuals and Mrs Scanlon that the issues are properly and fully um, understood by government. Well, because I think it's going to be devolved to local government, uh, that's in their submission. And in our uh, paper here from SPICE, it uh, does say that uh, it's going to be devolved to an organisation. What organisation are you expecting to take over the management of the 36 tenant farms of the Crown Estate? Well, there'll be a, there'll be a Crown, there will be a Crown Estate in Scotland. That will be the, that will be the body. So the Crown and Estate will remain as the. Well, see, this is where this is where we this is where this is where we've got to be very careful about Sorry, using. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand. No, no well, well, this is where we've got. Well, and, and this isn't. You know, this is not. This is not a guddle of my making. This is a guddle of Her Majesty's government's making, because of a lack of clarity from Her Majesty's government about the proper devolution of the Crown Estate function. Because when I sat on the Smith Commission and sat and had a discussion in good faith with all parties about the Crown Estate being devolved to Scotland, it was the devolution of the entire functions of the Crown Estate to Scotland, which would then be under the scrutiny of the Scottish Parliament. And yes, within that, we may take decisions to devolve particular functions to a, within Scotland to individual local authorities, as we've had very clearly presented to us by the three island authorities um, uh, Shetland, in Shetland, Orkney and the Western Isles. Um, but the, uh, so the, there would be a Crown Estate in Scotland. Where the, the issues have become somewhat muddled is the idea that somehow the, we would do that and then the Crown Estate would have some other activity going on. There has to be, for the, and for the issues of interest of the tenant farmers, um, there's a there would have to be some body to whom they were, um, well, some body whose land they were managing, and that would be the Crown Estate. So the Crown Estate would still be there in some form well, the Crown Estate, in terms well, of what I, 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 the, the Crown Estate functions will be devolved to Scotland, so that there will be a Crown Estate in Scotland, and it will be accountable to the Scottish Parliament. OK. Uh, committee, don't have any further questions. Can I thank the Minister and his colleagues for their contribution this morning? Uh, can I move the committee into a two-minute suspension to allow for the changeover?
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We can reconvene. Uh, the next item on our agenda is evidence on the Auditor General report for Scotland, uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, welcome Carleen Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, uh, Angela Cullen, Assistant Director, uh, Mark Roberts, Senior Manager, uh, and Mick Duff, Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. I uh, understand the Auditor General has a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener. The report I'm bringing to the committee today looks at the process of establishing the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, the pro progress the organisation is making in reforming how it delivers fire and rescue services, and some of the financial challenges the organisation faces in future. I'll briefly summarise our findings under three areas. First of all, the formation of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and its governance arrangements. Secondly, the costs and savings associated with the merger. And thirdly, reviewing future service delivery. It's important to note that at this point I focused on the merger process rather than on the longer term reform which the fire service is undertaking. I will keep this area under review and may report on it in future. Overall, we found that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service managed the merger of the eight former fire and rescue services effectively. The Scottish Government clearly defined the roles, expectations and initial targets for the Chair and the Chief Officer and eight of the ten recommendations that we made in our earlier report on learning the lessons of public body mergers have been implemented or are in progress. The SFR SFRS Board is starting to perform well in providing strategic direction and effective scrutiny of the management of the organisation, and in a variety of ways the Board has demonstrated that it is committed to improving its performance. One important aspect of the new arrangements is the network of 17 local senior officers who are responsible for maintaining links with local authorities, and this structure is proving to be effective. On costs and savings, the Financial Memorandum to the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 estimated a cost of £39.5 million for the establishment of the Fire and Rescue Service. The actual cost was £35.7 million, around 10% lower. Reported savings to date put the Fire and Rescue Service on track to exceed the overall expected savings of £328 million by March 2028, which were anticipated by the financial memorandum. However, as a result of future cost pressures and likely reductions in public sector budgets, we estimate that the Fire and Rescue Service may face a potential funding gap of £43 million by 2020. The Fire and Rescue Service does not yet have a long-term financial strategy to show how it will close the funding gap, and I believe it's now crucial that it agrees a long-term financial strategy by March 2016 to set out how that will be done. It's clear that this has been a challenging period for the organisation and its staff, but Her Majesty's Fire, and S Fire Service Inspector has concluded that there has been no impact on the public across the merger period. The Fire and Rescue Service's performance is improving and it's making progress in removing important differences in how the eight predecessor Fire and Rescue Services were managed and operated. Although the merger was managed effectively, in some respects the hard work of reform is yet to come. The Fire and Rescue Service is currently conducting a number of reviews to determine how it will deliver a national service in the future, addressing some of the important differences that we've previously reported on in the way that was done across Scotland in the past. These reviews aim to ensure that its resources are used as effectively as possible to provide a sustainable service that reflects current and future risks. Ensuring that these reviews are completed promptly and inform the development of a long-term financial strategy is a matter of urgency for the Fire and Rescue Service and a key part of the next stage of the reform process. As always, convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions from the committee. Okay, can I uh, start, uh, Auditor General, by referring you to paragraph three of your report where you, and you referred to this in your opening statement, the cost pressures that will be placed on the organisation resulting in potential savings of up to uh, 44 million having to be saved. Uh, can I just ask you in terms of your own experience and dealing with uh, some of the organisations and your experience, is, it, I mean, is this an alarming level of potential cost savings that have to be met? And in what areas would you expect the organisation to have to look at making these savings from? It, it's certainly um, a significant gap. There's no question about that. Um, I think the budget this year for the Fire and Rescue Service is about £230 million. So a funding gap of £40 million is significant in that context. There's no question about it. 
um, one of the uh, rationales for merger of the fire service across Scotland was to help it face the funding pressures that the government foresaw in the period we're currently in um, by uh, releasing resources that could be invested in fire services. Um, and there's been good progress made on doing that. The point we're making here, though, is that there is still a gap, even after the initial savings have been made in the first two years of the organisation's life. Um, and I think that the sorts of things the fire service is looking at are the areas we would expect. The reviews that we list in our report are looking at areas like workforce, assets, procurement, the use of ICT, all the important areas that both affect the effectiveness of the service and the amount it costs to do it. And we know from previous work carried out by Audit Scotland that there were very significant differences across Scotland that didn't appear to be related either to the level of risk which was faced in different parts of Scotland or the effectiveness of fire services. So the right things are in hand, but it is a significant gap and it will be very important that those reviews come together to um, inform a financial strategy that shows how the gap will be closed five years from now. So, and can I just ask in terms of, in percentage terms, the savings compared to the overall budget, uh, do, do we then reach a stage where perhaps we get to the, to the bare bones of what's available and then perhaps uh, there can be issues relating to staffing levels and potential workforce planning in respect to that? I think that's a question you might want to address with your following pan panel of witnesses. What we show in the report is that significant savings were made in the first two years um, by reducing some of the obvious duplication that was there in management structures, in support services, in the other achievements that were done. Um, in many ways, they, they were significant achievements, but they're some of the easier savings to take out in practice. The more difficult things are looking at the um, allocation of control rooms, of fire stations around Scotland, um, the ways in which uh, shift duties are organised which have been very different in the past those are challenging things to get right and the challenge for the fire service is to make sure it does them in ways which protect the service um, while uh, taking out the costs that need to be found over the next five years okay. Ms. Gunn. In paragraph 47 you, and in your opening statement you say the public had neither noticed or suffered any reduced level of service um, which is obviously very good news but as I read through the report, um, I notice that, uh, page 10, the post-implementation review due six months after the merger, uh, we're, we've now waited over two years and we still don't have it. Uh, on page 11, the audit results uh, about collecting views from users, staff and stakeholders on performance, we're still waiting for that. You've, paragraph 22, you've identified main risks in the corporate register. I, I, I won't read them all out. But also on Exhibit 8, um, you've got uh, workforce awaiting consideration by the board, asset management due to be decided this month, and procurement. So I'm just wondering how you could make this statement not noticed or suffered any reduced level when we're waiting for quite a considerable amount of information, including the post-implementation review. The um, evidence that I used in reaching that conclusion came from Her Majesty's Fire Service Inspectorate review um, in 2013 of the uh, progress that had been made on reform and the uh, government's mid-year review of performance for the same year. Um, and I think it's important to note, as I said in my opening statement, that that was about the transition from the eight former um, fire and rescue services to the new service initially. Um, we know that it was a difficult time for the organisation itself and for staff, as I said in my opening statement, and we know that there are some difficult choices that are, have started to be made and that will continue to be needed in the years ahead. Um, we've seen, for example, the handling of the um, control room closures that are planned across Scotland. Um, the, I'm confident that the evidence we have supports the fact that during the transition, as the report says, there was no impact on the public, and there are difficult decisions to come that will need to be carefully worked through, both with elected representatives here and in the 32 councils around Scotland, um, and with members of the public themselves. The fire service is a service that people care a great deal about, are attached to, particularly in the more remote parts of Scotland, um, and we know that those decisions are difficult to take in ways that 
uh, can help people understand um, the, co the costs and benefits that are involved and what it will mean for them. This is very much work in progress, but the initial stages were handled well. I, I just wondered, Auditor General, if either you or the auditors who I undertook this um, inquiry, were you given any reason why there's been a 20-month delay in the post-implementation review due in six months? It's now 26 months. Uh, was there a reason why that hasn't been done? Or? I'll ask Mark to pick that up in a moment. You're absolutely right, though. That's one of the um, recommendations that we made in our managing yeah. measures report, which has not been completed, one of the two. Mark, would you like to pick that one? I mean, it's, as you say, something which, which wasn't done and was only one of the two of the ten recommendations from our previous report put that wasn't done. The, the services recognised and acknowledges that that's, that's not something which it has done as committed to, to going ahead and doing that. Um, and the committee may wish to, to ask the, the next panel of witnesses about that. We think it's very important because we see this as a, a merger that went very well. Um, and so we want the lessons learned to be captured um, rel as soon as possible and so they can be shared with other parts of the public sector. Okay. I, I mentioned the risks in paragraph 22. Are these risks, um, are they a cause for concern? And can I, I'll just pitch in my final question. This is the first time we've looked at uh, a report for the whole of Scotland um, you may remember, Auditor General, or might have been before your time, but the Accounts Commission had a very critical, highly critical report of the Highlands and Islands Fire and Rescue Service. So I, I was hoping that many of the issues, and I know many of them, have been addressed over the years. But, you know, I can't ask about the Highlands and Islands. I can only ask about the whole of Scotland. So uh, first question about the risks, but are there geographic areas that you feel still need a bit more attention, or do we have a consistent level of service across Scotland? Um, you're absolutely right that Audit Scotland, on behalf of the Accounts Commission, produced a series of reports in 2012 about the predecessor fire and, service, fire and rescue services. Um, and they showed both a great deal of unexplained variation across Scotland in um, the way in which the fire service was provided and particular problems in the former Highlands and Islands Fire and Rescue Service. Um, the work that we've done demonstrates that the new Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has started the process of addressing those differences and making sure that it can uh, produce a more consistent service across Scotland that reflects those very important regional differences. Um, and there is very much more to do. Um, I think it's fair to say that some of the challenges in providing a fire and rescue services in some of the most remote most remote parts of Europe that we see in Highlands and Islands aren't easy to crack. We're satisfied that the work that's going on through the reviews is starting to address them, but there are no easy fixes, and it's why I made the comment about some of the hard work of reform still being there to be done. We're not surprised by the risks which are in the corporate risk register. In a sense, we'd be more concerned if they weren't there. We take assurance from the fact that the um, reviews we mention in, I think, Exhibit 5 are focusing on the right areas to address those in future and to do it in a way which can be managed within the funding that's likely to be avail available in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think at the beginning I'd just like to comment on how good a report this is, actually. Uh, the merger has gone extremely well, and all the way through this uh, document... Uh, there's positive remarks about uh, the way it's been managed and the way it's been implemented. I think I'd like to ask a question about page 5, paragraph 3, about the potential funding gap, which is obviously a, very much a notional uh, gap. What future cost pressures did you take into account and what reductions in funding did you take into account to reach that figure? I'll ask colleagues to come in in a moment, but it might be helpful to refer you to Exhibit 6 on page 21. Um, what that exhibit is showing in the top line is that, um, broadly, we agree um, with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service about the likely cost pressures they have in future. Um, they've done a good job in understanding um, the costs they've inherited from their predecessor organisations and in reviewing how they're likely to change in future through things like pay inflation, um, the impact of the VAT, the other changes that are coming through. Where we differ from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in, is in our view of what the likely funding is likely to be to meet those costs. So this, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service planning is 
is based on um, steady state budgets between now and 2020. We think if you look at the forecasts of public spending coming through from the OBR and others, it's more likely that there will be a reduction. Um, so the big difference between us is, is in the likely level of budget available to cover those costs rather than in the costs themselves. I'll ask Mick if he can pick up by talking a bit more about the costs which are included in the top line there to help you understand that. The main cost increases relate to inflationary costs for staff costs and non-staff costs and a potential three million increase in 2016-17 as a result of uh, an increase in employers' national insurance contributions. Mm. I mean, obviously, a lot of this is... Uh, it's difficult actually to pin down, isn't it? Because we don't know what the reductions in funding are going to be. We might have a better idea come July, but at the moment, uh, I doubt even the Scottish Government knows what reductions are coming down the line. So I think that you could take almost any public piece of the public sector and uh, project that there's going to be cuts. I don't know. One of the reasons why we think a long-term financial strategy is so important. Mm. You're right, we don't know what the exact figures will be, but what a long-term financial strategy can do is take a number of likely scenarios and plot them out. We think, given what we do know about the UK government's spending plans and the time it would take for any further devolution of financial powers to the Scottish Parliament to take effect, there is a, a strong likelihood that during the five years we've looked at there will be a reduction in the overall Scottish budget. Um, we've applied that on a consistent basis to the Fire and Rescue Service, but if other parts of public services were protected, the reduction for Fire and Rescue Services would be greater. So we think our um, forecast is a reasonable one, although clearly there is an element of uncertainty in all forms of forecasting. I was looking at uh, page 12, paragraph 13, and it, there's a, a sort of a, a recurrent theme through the reports we've been seeing over these past few years. Uh, you're saying here that uh, counts, it's, it's referring to councillors, local councillors, mm -hmm. that councillors on these boards had not in general provided strong strategic leadership. And that seems to be repetitive through so many of the reports. I mean, is it indicative, indicative of a greater problem? I think it was a particular issue for fire and rescue services because in most parts of Scotland they were previously provided through joint boards that brought together councillors from a number of authorities onto a special purpose board that, looks at, that looked at fire and rescue services. Um, first of all, it wasn't their main area of focus. They'd been elected to represent their area on the council as a whole rather than the fire service. And secondly, as Audit Scotland previously reported for the Accounts Commission, they tended to be very poorly supported Supported. There was little dedicated support in terms of um, analysis or challenge which would able, enable them to ask questions of the officers providing the fire and rescue services. Um, that was part of the rationale for moving to a new national service with its own dedicated board. Um, and it's one of the real improvements we think we've seen as a result of reform. Um, the board recognises it's got further to go, but it's clearly both providing greater challenge to the service than was the case before reform and is much better place to provide strategic direction working with the officers who make up the service itself. Thank you. Can I start by um, gently picking up the point about uh, where income comes from for any public service? The government at the moment have a tax power they could put up, do they not? And therefore, the, all the assumptions that you've uh, discussed with Mr Beattie are, of course, I'm sure fair to, to point out. But I do get a little frustrated when I hear everyone saying it's someone else's fault. We have a power in this place right now to put tax up if we wanted to invest more in public services, don't we? At the moment, um, as of 1st of April this year, is a power to um, raise the small taxes of land and beauty. No, no, but 3p in the tax, tax, which existed from 99 onwards, means you can put tax up if you choose to as a government. It existed for a period yeah. until the implementation of the Scotland Act and was then, and then repealed. And withdrew it for other reasons. And what well, I'm indeed. looking at here is the funding that's available yeah. between 1516 and 1920. Yeah, yeah. OK, but that's um, covered in some context. Um, I, I really rather more seriously wanted to ask about... Um, the, I, I agree with Mr Beattie's observations about how strong this report is in terms of how well this merge has gone. Um, would you, the, the Auditor General rightly mentioned the lessons learned. Um, would she care to give an oversight as to why this has gone so well when police has clearly been the opposite? I'll ask the team to chip in because we've thought a lot about yeah. this as, as the work's been progressing. Um, I think one of the differences, though, is that the structure of the Fire and Rescue Service is simpler. 
um, for understandable reasons, when the reform process was going through, um, the Parliament approved a structure for policing, which provided a separate um, Scottish police authority to which the Scottish Police Service is accountable, reflecting um, all of the well-known concerns about the role of policing in a democratic state. For the Fire and Rescue Service, we've seen a single body, which, like many other public bodies, is accountable uh, to this Parliament through the accountable officer, and where the roles and um, responsibilities were more clearly defined very early on. Mark, do you want to expand on that a bit? I don't, I don't think there's much more to say. I think, um, in addition to that, the board, from the point at which it was, was appointed prior to the, the service coming into existence, was very much focused on um, ensuring that it worked effectively and um, was it continually trying to improve how it held the management of the service to account. Um, and as we say in the report and, and various points, they've done a lot of work at trying to ensure that the, the information that they get from the service is what the board wants in terms of performance and finance and risk. Um, and they're very focused on, on continuous improvement and understanding the nature of the service and its job. Um, and that's, that's worked very, very well. I think I'm sure that's very fair. Um, Auditor General, you said... Um, uh, the rules and responsibilities of the single body were clearly defined earlier on. Could you just elaborate on that? Again, that strikes me as exactly what did not happen with police. You may recall when I reported on police reform um, at the end of 2013, that was one of the clear findings, that, that the roles and responsibilities had not been clear at the point when the new uh, police service was being established, and it took longer than it should have done for those to have been clarified. Um, the sponsoring team responsible for that within government were clear and therefore provided that clarity to the incoming board and to the management team of the new fire service, which, for whatever reason, which we never got to the bottom, bottom of, didn't happen with police. That's true, and the, um, the basic structures were more straightforward yeah, here, so there was less scope for confusion. Sure, between I think the that's a fair point, too. Can I just ask one other question, um, if I may, convener, and that relates to uh, Para 63... Um, with relation, in relation to the retained fire system, fire service, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, the report accurately says affects 85% of Scotland's fire stations. Mary Scanlon was, was reflecting this, and I couldn't agree more with, with that challenge. Uh, your report says that, um, uh, that there is some work going on here with respect to the longer and indeed medium term options. Um, do you, c have you got any perspective, and I'm obviously going to ask the later witnesses about this, have you got any perspective on your confidence that that will happen? Because this is, if I may say, so fundamental even to the island I live on. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right about its importance. I think your question is much better aimed to yeah. your following witnesses. Um, but I think it's fair to say that this is an area where there is no simple answer. Um, fire reform across the UK has been a, a live topic for more than a decade now. Um, when the Bain report was published in around 2003, uh, the retained duty system was seen as being key to um, providing services in more remote and rural areas. I think there's now a growing doubt about whether actually that is possible, given ch people's changing lifestyles, mm. the difficulty in being available when needed. Um, and my understanding is that that's very much at the core of what the Fire and Rescue Service is trying to review at the moment, to come up at some, with something which is sustainable and is affordable for these remote and rural communities where it's been very important in the past. Did they suggest to you when you were discussing this with them that there needed to be, as it were, a reconsideration of, of the, I mean, they need to appoint someone else to have a look at this, in other words, a new bean, or, or is it just going to be an internal exercise of the current fire board and the fire it's service? An exercise being and do you think that's adequate? Do you think that's enough, given how serious, given it affects 85% of our fire stations, do you think that's enough? I, th I think at pre present that's the sort of the I have to rely on, on, the, on the fire service sure. to just kind of provide yeah. the, the, the key source of expertise yeah. about how this is done, and I think that is appropriate. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Can I just add to that, Mr. Scott, by saying we, one of the things we think has gone well in this is using the different experience that came together across Scotland to make the changes we've already seen. Mm. So if you look at the way in which um, standard fire appliances are now crude, the experience that had been built up in parts of Scotland that did it differently and more effectively mm. in the past are playing into the new models. We're seeing that expertise being used well. That's not to say it's guaranteed to work around retained firefighters, but that, that experience of learning from what's working in other parts of Scotland has been one of the success stories of this so far. Okay. Thank you. Joe Don. Thank you, uh, And I'm grateful to Mr Scott for getting where he did, because in my, my, I want to really just continue that. I'm, I'm looking at paragraphs 55 and 57, but you won't need to worry about the detail, because it's the general point. Um, <laughs> that you observe in, in paragraph 55 that home safety visits have made a difference. I suspect they've actually made a huge difference. 
Um, and in 57, you comment about uh, malicious false alarms, but more importantly, equipment failure false alarms. Now, the next panel undoubtedly the people to ask about the details of all that, but my question to you in the context, Auditor General, is are you satisfied that the way in which these questions are being addressed uh, makes sense and we've got the appropriate level of expertise? And again, should other people be involved in some of this or do you think the the, the fire service is actually correctly addressing these in principle? Stage, yes. We think they're looking at the right areas. And as I said, in response to Mr. Scott's question, the experience so far is that they have, they've tapped in well to experience in different parts of Scotland that have tried innovative <laughs> approaches that have worked. And we make the point in the report that the changes that will be needed in future are significant, not just because of the funding gap, but because the nature of the risk is changing so significantly, and particularly in Scotland, because it varies so markedly across the country. Um, so we'll be continuing to look at how well those reviews are being carried out and how well they're leading to changes in practice. But at this stage, we think the groundwork is well in place. Much obliged. Thank you. And uh, finally, I'll be stopped. A question from Mary Scanlon. Yes, we were very critical, uh, if you remember, about the police because they didn't develop a full business case. Um, on page 10, um, you do say that the second paragraph that uh, uh, Fire and Rescue Service did not develop a full business case to look at costs and savings, etc. Um, could you perhaps expand on that? How it, how essential or not of that course. was. We actually say on page 10 that the Scottish Government um, didn't develop a full business case. Um, and it was, the same, it was the same business case for police and fire reform. The develop the yes. business case, OK. And the reason we haven't reported on it further in this report is that um, it, we reported it in the report on police reform in November 2013. Okay. It was the same business case. We felt okay. there was nothing more to say. Um, but it, 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 the same issue applies. So the same... Yeah. So it was the Scottish Government didn't uh, develop a full business case. Is that one of the reasons that you've been uh, a bit critical about Fire and Rescue Service not having a long-term financial strategy is that because and is that perhaps one of the reasons for the delay in post-implementation reviews because or, or what has been the effect yeah. of not having a full business case at the start what's been the impact as with the police reform and, and our report then, the absence of the full business case makes the long-term financial strategy all the more important. That business case not having been developed um, and the outline business case not being updated means that having that picture up to date now, taking account of all of the experience since about the financial pressures and how they'll be addressed is even more critical than it would have been had there been a full business case. That's true on both. I don't think it has any relevance to the um, failure to carry out a post-implementation review. That's a separate issue. Okay. Um, and as Mark said, we understand from the Fire and Rescue Service they intend to carry one out, and it's one of our recommendations that they should do that quickly. So that but you would be looking for a more robust long-term financial strategy Very much so. at this point in time, Absolutely. which you don't have. No, and that's the key recommendation from this report, that I... it should be in place by next March. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr Smith? Uh, um, you uh, discussed the issue of the, the long-term strategy and how to deal with the, the, the funding gap that you've identified. Um, I just want, and you suggested that's a five to ten year strategy that should be available by March of next year. Um, I just asked you to comment on that you think that is that that's entirely deliverable for the for the fire service of where they are now in terms of their financial planning. You think it's reasonable that, that a report of that magnitude can be produced in that kind of uh, scale of time? I think it will be challenging, but we do think the work that they've got underway with the various service reviews is exactly what's needed to inform it. I'll ask Mark to give you a bit more detail about the work in progress. The, as as we, we've highlighted in, in Exhibit 15 on, on 13, there's kind of four major kind of strands of work which, which, which are on, ongoing, um, which will come to fruition over, over the, the next nine, nine to ten, ten months. In addition to that, as the Auditor General has previously mentioned, there's the reviews about workforce procurement, asset management and ICT, which will, will all be kind of coming together. And the long-term financial strategy is putting the, the pounds signs around all those things. So we see that those things coming together 
um, over the next nine to ten, ten months in parallel long-term financial strategies ent entirely reasonable. So, um, I, I take your point about the differences between the, the fire service and the, the police service in terms of complexity uh, 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 and other issues, but um, do, do you think in terms of that uh, plan and particularly the, the focus, the workforce element of that plan and planning for how many personnel will be needed into the future, um, does is the fire service in a, in a position to benefit from the fact that there is, frankly, less political interest and headcount in the fire service than there has been uh, over a prolonged period of time in the, in the police service, where you know we, part of the criticism has been that uh, you know money is removed from one area uh, and numbers of staff are reduced in one area in order to preserve in a, a different area? Do you think there is a more comprehensive approach to workplace planning in the fire service? On police reform, I made the point that having um, a fixed target for the number of police officers made their financial strategy more challenging because it re reduced their room for manoeuvre in a very significant part of the budget. Now, that's a, that's a policy which the government is entitled to set and it has a consequence, which is that your financial management becomes more difficult. The fire service doesn't have the same um, constraints around it in that sense, which means it's more able to work with its staff, with the unions, with local communities to look at different options for the way the fire service is provided. Um, and we think they're taking that opportunity well at this stage. That's not to say there won't be some very difficult decisions further down the line, but it does mean they've got more room for manoeuvre in looking at what their options might be. So perhaps some lessons for politicians as well as for the people who uh, run our emergency services. But can I maybe just end with, I don't know if you looked at, um, uh, in, in, you comment in the report about the reductions in fire incidents, uh, which of course we are all welcome. Did you, did you have any awareness of how that's reflected in other parts of the world or in other parts of the UK? I mean, clearly in, uh, that's a long-term trend we've seen in terms of reduction in crime, uh, mm -hmm. although we see that used a, a lot as a measure of success in the police services. Is there a similar story to tell on fire and rescue? Or? There is. Again, I'll ask Mark to pick this up in a moment, but um, we're seeing both an impact of uh, prevention visits and so on, which Mr Don referred to earlier, but also much wider societal changes like people being less likely to use chip pans and improvements in furniture design and so on. Mark, what do we know about the international comparisons? We, to be fair, we, did, we didn't look, look in detail to any international comparisons, but I understand kind of um, in in many parts of, of Europe, there's a similar pattern going on for exactly the same, same reason. European legislation on, on fire retardant furniture applies across, across Europe, so similar things that the Auditor General has just mentioned apply. Um, I'm sure the fire service would be able to kind of provide more information on, on that. So. Thank you. Hey, can I thank the panel for their contribution? Uh, we're going to allow for a brief interval and reconvene at 11 o'clock.
this report entitled the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I'd like to welcome Pat Waters, Chair of the Board of Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and Alistair Hay, the Chief Officer of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I understand Mr Waters has a, a brief opening statement. Chairman, not no really an opening statement, but to, just to say that we, we welcome the report. It's always encouraging um, to have outside uh, organisations looking at how you're conducting your business and giving you a report on that. So we welcome the report and welcome the opportunity to, to answer any questions on it. OK. Uh, can I, by way of uh, introducing the first question, uh, refer you in a similar question that I'd put to the Auditor General uh, in connection with the potential savings that have to be made by 2020, which are referred to in paragraph three of the report. Uh, I just wonder for the record if you could confirm that you accept those uh, findings uh, and if you could elaborate on, on how the organi your organisation would be seeking to make those savings. We certainly would question the, 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 the figures that are put down. Uh, as a, a projection, as not a, an exact science, that say uh, we have got um, projections for ourselves that gives us uh, options and how we would do that. Although we, the, there was mention of no long-term strategy, we do have a, a critical savings pathway that takes us right through to 2020, and we have options on that. Obviously, in the light of the figures that's come out from Audit Scotland, we will have a look at that and maybe readjust that. But it's a, it's a projection. So, although I, I wouldn't say I accept the figures, I accept the, the theory behind that calculation and the impact on our budget if that does happen. But you accept the direction of travel is there's going to be substantial cost savings that have to be made in the run-up to 2020? Yes, we do. Okay. And in terms of the kind of areas that would be pursued, are there any red lines that would be uh, in place to, that, that you wouldn't pursue? Well, I think our, our first priority is to protect the front line and other service to communities in Scotland. Um, so that would be an area that we would work and always work to try and protect. So when you say, red, so when you say uh, front line, uh, I mean, what would be off limits. I mean, obviously there's been reviews carried out in the past mm. that have referred to control rooms, uh, shift rosters, uh, you know, staff savings. Are, are those the areas that your organisation would seek to pursue? Would that we be a thing? We will continue to pursue those areas. And obviously we have got um, some work being done at the present time in looking at a, a, a fire review of cover in Scotland and looking about where the priorities are, where the risks are, and how we actually tackle that. But I'm sure the Chief Officer would maybe want to comment on that as well. Okay. Um, I also welcome the report from Audit Scotland. The main purpose of the Fire and Rescue Service is to make communities safer. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to note in the report that in terms of those safety outcomes, uh, reducing the number of fatalities, the number of casualties, both in fires and special services, uh, we are improving those safety outcomes. In relation to uh, the money that we have available to deliver safety outcomes for the community of Scotland, I also recognise within this report that the budget has been managed uh, prudently to date. Uh, looking forward, uh, I think across the whole of the public sector, everybody uh, is anticipating there is a potential for a reduction uh, in, in budgets going forward. Um, we are on track to deliver the savings that were identified um, through the fire reform um, process, uh, £328 million uh, by 2027-28. That was the anticipated savings asked off the Fire and Rescue Service, and we've had a strong focus on that. Um, we, like Audit Scotland, have projected forward to 1920 uh, financial year, um, and we have anticipated that our cost base will increase within the organisation. But what we anticipated was that we would have a steady state in terms of our budget. Um, and what we would have to do is we would have to absorb the normal inflationary pressures uh, and other changes within regulation and other changes within legislation, uh, particularly the increase uh, in the employer's contribution. So the cost ba base would go up, and what we would need to do uh, is maintain our budget uh, at a steady state. The reason why we made that assumption was because it was in line uh, with some of the predictions earlier made by Professor Gowdy, uh, and equally in working with our sponsored department, in the absence of any uh, real decisions uh, on what future budget provision would be, that was a reasonable assumption to make. 
Even with that, we anticipated that we would have a funding gap of approximately £8.5 million by the time we got to 1920. And of course, we, we thought, well, uh, anticipating a potential uh, reduction in our budget, we estimated uh, 5%, and that would give us a funding gap of approximately £20 million. If you use the offset budget responsibilities figures, then clearly that gap approaches £43 million. Uh, the approach Whatever that gap will be, and it is a potential gap, and it's, it's prudent that you plan for this, of course, so we welcome the Auditor-General's report in that respect about strengthening our long-term financial strategy. Uh, the approach that we will take on this uh, will be to continue to look at uh, the best practice guidance uh, offered by Audit Scotland. It is about um, a reduction in uh, the number of people that work within the organisation, it identifies within the report that 79% of our budget uh, is based on staff costs. So to take that much out of the budget, you would have to reduce headcount in the organisation. Uh, what we'd also look at is a rationalisation of our uh, assets uh, and the contracts that we engage in uh, across Scotland. We'll also look at streamlining processes and finally working in partnership uh, to do shared services uh, with other public bodies here within Scotland and indeed other organisations. Those are the areas, but our focus will always be uh, on using the resources that we have in Scotland to best effect to improve the safety outcomes of the people of Scotland. Can I ask Mr Hay, when you referred to headcount, uh, does that also include firefighters? Firefighters are, 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 are the key to delivering successful outcomes, and I'm always extremely re reluctant to reduce the number of firefighters uh, that we have within Scotland. Um, however, as was alluded to uh, in the evidence uh, given by uh, the Auditor-General earlier, we do not have a fixed number of firefighters in Scotland. Uh, we had approximately uh, 4,000 uh, whole-time firefighters um, before we came into uh, the single service. As we stand today, we've got approximately 3,850 whole-time firefighters, so we have seen a reduction, but it's a flexible way in which you uh, deploy these firefighters, ensuring that you have the availability of our frontline uh, emergency response vehicles, but also frontline staff that can deliver the essential prevention work that we focus on. So we have reduced them, but if we were to take uh, the amount of money out of the budget that has potentially been indicated uh, within this report, you would have to look at uh, a reduction in the number of whole-time firefighters across Scotland. You just ask finally, would that envisage being uh, compulsory redundancies? One of the biggest uh, factors, I believe, in ensuring uh, what has been a successful reform to date is that promise of no compulsory redundancies in the Fire and Rescue Service. Clearly, as you go through a reform process, it is an anxious time for staff. It is the staff that have made the difference here. Uh, and that promise of no compulsory redundancies has meant that they have been very open uh, to sharing their experiences. They've been very open uh, to changing working practices and being flexible in their approach. If you were to remove that promise of no compulsory redundancies, I think it would have uh, a detrimental effect on our ability to truly reform the Fire and Rescue Service and bring about the changes uh, that, that we anticipate will be needed in a changing environment going forward. So it's a policy that the Scottish Government have. It's a policy that has been readily endorsed by uh, the Board and the senior management of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and I believe it is a key element to success. Um, we have got uh, a workforce plan going forward. Uh, so up to 2019-2020, um, uh, we know uh, how many people would be anticipated to retire uh, through um, reaching their normal retirement dates, uh, and that number would go nowhere near uh, addressing uh, a reduction in our budget on the scale that the Office for Budget Responsibility uh, indicated might be possible within the Fire and Rescue Service or other public bodies. Mary Scanlon. Um, can you tell the committee why the post-implementation uh, 
review to monitor progress and look at whether you're on course to deliver the long-term benefits. Why it's 20 months late? Well, I think you're, you're right, it is late. And um, I think, like say, in, in six months, it was maybe too early to actually look about what was the effect of that transformation. The, the reform process is a, is a three-year project. Um, we have been indicated um, that we will have that report um, with the government shortly. Um, it's certainly well on its way to being produced. Uh, I accept it was late, but I think we'll get better information from it um, with the delay that we've, we've actually uh, incurred. And the collecting views from users, staff and stakeholders, uh, the audit results from that, they've not yet been published. Is there any reason for that? Or when is that due? Page 11. Um, do you mind if I just go back and address your first question um, to a degree? Um, clearly doing a review um, of the reform process within the first six months is a recommendation made by Audit Scotland in relation to the best practice guide on how to bring about public service uh, mergers. Um, I agree with Pat that um, we will be better placed to produce a meaningful report uh, when we've got more experience of how we've actually brought the, the service together. And I think the timing of it now as we come towards the end of the third year will mean that it will be a more meaningful report, uh, particularly in the light of the comments that were made by Audit Scotland that this has been a successful merger uh, and it would be beneficial anticipate, anticipating perhaps uh, further mergers in, mergers in the public sector um, this has been a successful merger and it would be useful for people uh, to learn lessons not only about what has not gone well within a merger, but importantly what has gone well. So I think the timing of that will be important. Uh, but that, that said, um, the Chief Inspector of Fire and Rescue Services, Stephen Torrey, uh, he did do an inspection uh, within the first six months of the Fire and Rescue Service to make sure that critically we were on track to deliver the benefits of reform, uh, that uh, the public weren't noticing that there'd been a change uh, in the governance of the Fire and Rescue Service as opposed to what we actually do to make communities safer. Uh, and what he also um, reported on was that it was being managed well. So we did have that review uh, within the first six months conducted by Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Fire and Rescue Services for Scotland. And what we've also embarked upon is a series of uh, gateway reviews um, to make sure that the whole programme management of this is being conducted robustly, uh, and that is focused on the blueprint and delivering the benefits of re route reform. So we've had a whole series of these prior to uh, us going live as a service within the first uh, year of the new service. And we've also had one recently where it indicated uh, that we were green and we were on track to deliver the benefits of reform. So when we get to the end of the three years, I'm confident that we, we will have delivered the benefits of reform, but importantly, we'll be in a place to produce a really useful and meaningful report to help others going forward within uh, the future. Um, can I just move on to Exhibit 9 on page 25? Um, the firefighter absences in 2013 were 9.1 shifts against a target of 8.4. Uh, you've changed your target, and I appreciate 2014-15, we're talking about the end of quarter three, but the absences were 7.1 against a target of 6.4 quite a reduction in the target. Other staff absences, uh, 6.3 against the target of 6 last year, and that's been reduced to 4.5 shifts against a target of 2.6. Now, we often sit here and criticise the NHS for not reaching a 4% target, but you have significantly reduced your target for firefighter absences and staff absences, neither of which were met last year. Is this a reasonable thing to do? Is it part of the cost-cutting exercise? And, you know, does it reflect the sort of normal ongoing needs of uh, your firefighters and staff? <laughs> 
important that we actually encourage staff to attend work um, where that's appropriate. I mean, we are an emergency service, uh, and as an emergency service, we have got a, a situation where our, um, particularly our firefighters, working in, in extremely dangerous circumstances, and at times, um, somebody who's off ill as a result of, of work-related. I think, equally, in times of change, it is extremely difficult um, to um, ensure that staff are comfortable on, on, on going forward. And our staff have been under tremendous amount of pressure um, during the, the last two years. It's only in recent weeks that we've actually um, concluded our um, review of our support staff. And, matter of fact, we went out to, to ballot for that on in, in Tuesday of this week. Now, given the fact that people were guaranteed a job and knew they had a job, given the fact that they didn't know maybe what that job was or where it was, was extremely pressure for the staff. You know, and they, they were under a lot of strain during that period. We're hoping once we get to the, the situation of if we get an agreement with the trade union how we move forward in our, our staffing structure, that things would settle down and become clearer for staff and staff would be much easier as a result of that. You know, so very, sorry. No, no, I'm it, it, it was very much because of the dangerous circumstances and the harrowing experiences of well, many I, firefighters that you know, I was shocked that you've reduced the target from 8.4 to 6 and for staff it's gone down from 6 to 2.6. I mean, we all want to encourage people to go to work, of course, um, but at the same time we have to respect the fact that sometimes people are ill and sometimes it takes them a bit of time to recover from some of the experience we, experiences we expect firefighters to do. I'm just shocked that, given the absences weren't achieved, that you've actually brought in a very significant reduction in your target, both for firefighters and uh, for staff. And I ask that against an understanding uh, of the incredible work they do. Yeah. Um. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to hear the concern for staff that work within the Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, firefighters do work in an inherently dangerous environment. Uh, and, much, and, yeah. and, and they are. Uh, they do see things that uh, are quite harrowing at yeah. times. And because of that, what we have is a very supportive uh, system within the service. Uh, the welfare of our staff is one of the things that is uppermost in our thoughts. If I can just perhaps explain uh, the target to you. Um, this is a target that is set within uh, the framework, the, the fire and rescue framework for Scotland. Um, and the way that it operates is the target that we've got to uh, aim to hit in terms of staff attendance is based on uh, the average attendance of the, of the previous three years. Uh, and what, what we have to get is the middle uh, of the average um, of the best performing antecedent service over the last three years. So every year as we roll forward, the target automatically changes because of the way that it was set up within uh, the framework. And that is why you see that um, attendance has improved in the fire and rescue service. It quite clearly uh, demonstrates that. It also shows you that the target has got tougher, uh, but that is be because of the way that the arithmetic works, the way that the actual target has been set up within the framework uh, for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. But that doesn't detract from the fact that we absolutely understand uh, that good attendance is important in all public sectors, uh, organisations and, uh, and all organisations, but equally we have a very supportive uh, welfare system within the Fire and Rescue Service. I do appreciate that, but just before going to my final question, uh, can I just ask... Um, are the unions representing your members, are they quite content about these uh, significant reductions in uh, firefighter and staff absence targets? Well, I don't think... Um, I mean, uh, I think we have a very good relationship with our representative bodies, both in, um, in firefighters and in our support staff. Uh, I think, like I said, they would be willing to work with us um, to ensure that what we do is treat staff you know, with dignity uh, and support when it's necessary, uh, but also that we try and make sure that we get the maximum attendance as is possible. It is not an attempt to, to, to get um, people who are ill or injured uh, back to their work. 
but it is an indication that we want to try and achieve the maximum attendance that's possible during yeah. that period. And we will always work with our trade unions to try and ensure that we do that sympathetically. Well, I do understand all that, but I did ask you the question, if I may, if I could get an answer, because maybe I'm pursuing the wrong but, issue here. But can here. I say that I can't but answer can on just, behalf of the uh, trade unions? Well, you're working day and daily with yes. the trade unions. They represent the firefighters and the staff, and I would like... I'd like to know if they are content with the significant reduction in the target for absences that's contained within this Audit Scotland report. That's all I... I, I know what your commitments are. I'm just asking one direct question. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't asked them that exact specific question. Oh, so they don't know and, about this? No, they know about the targets. All right. Uh, but I haven't asked it in the manner in which... And they're quite which, happy with it. I, I haven't asked it in the manner okay. in which... Uh, you've just presented okay. it to me, but I'm happy to go back and do that. But what I can say is that we do have uh, a partnership working arrangement with all of our trade unions, but particularly the Fire Brigade Union, when we're speaking about firefighters here. And very recently, uh, what we produced was a new uh, attendance management policy uh, with the underpinning procedures for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, and we did that uh, working in partnership uh, with the Fire Brigade Union, so they, they, they understand the targets that, that, that are set. What they also uh, have done is they've worked with us to make sure that the policies and the procedures we have are designed to improve attendance, but are very supportive of the staff that work within the organisation. Well, I'll, I'll maybe get a, a visit. The final uh, question uh, relates a visit from firemen, but we'll see. A brief, a brief final a, a, Very brief, and it's about the retained firefighters. Um, the convener was asking you about you know, uh, losing staff and losing headcount. Uh, around the Inverness area, there's uh, thir over 30% vacancies for retained firefighters. And I know that 85% of Scotland's 359 stations rely wholly or in part on their service. It is a matter of serious concern to people in remote and rural areas that retained firefighters have to commit up to 120 hours a week. It barely gives them seven hours a night to sleep. They have to commit all that time to your service. Do you think that you would get more retained firefighters were you to reduce that level of commitment, given that people have families and jobs, etc.? And are you concerned about the 30% vacancies around Inverness itself? Maybe start off and then hand over to, to, the, to the Chief Officer to answer that. Are we concerned? Absolutely, uh, Mrs. Scanlon, we are, we are concerned. Um, I don't think it's the first time, either before this committee or other committees in the Parliament, that we have actually said that we have an issue with uh, the retained duty system. We believe, and that's why we have made it a priority, that we need to make a system work that delivers for rural communities in Scotland. Um, we believe that the, the retained duty system is broken. Um, it's not something that's happened within the past two years, but probably within the past 10 to 15 years. There's been various attempts, not only in Scotland, but other areas of the UK and elsewhere, to try and look at how we operate a retained duty system uh, and make it work. Um, family circumstances, you're absolutely right, have changed. Um, hence, the commitment we ask for people is a lot, and that's why we've made it a priority to get a piece of work done, which we'll be reporting probably before the end of this year, and how we try and take that matter forward. Um, I can't tell you what the outcome is. The but commitment. Well, I can't tell you what the outcome is, because it's still a work no, in progress. You'll be at looking present. at that. Sorry, yes, yeah. absolutely. Of course, I'm concerned about the availability uh, of retained firefighters across Scotland. Um, we are absolutely a service that is focused on improving safety outcomes. And, you know, predominantly, it's our firefighters that, through their prevention activities and their emergency response, that do that. So we want to maximise the availability uh, of our staff, irrespective of the duty system that they operate. Um, it's clear in this report how significant uh, retained firefighters are to the safety of communities right across Scotland, but particularly in, in rural areas. Um, over 90 per cent of the land mass of Scotland is protected by retained duty firefighters, uh, and over 40 per cent of our operational staff are actually retained. Uh, but as the Chair uh, has just pointed out, this is not uh, 
an issue that has emerged in the last couple of years. This is an issue that has emerged uh, probably over the last couple of decades. Uh, the retained duty system, as we know it, was a system that was designed for the 1950s. Uh, and society uh, you know, would be unrecognisable in the 50s compared to how it is now. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to design uh, a retained system, if that's what we're going to call it, that's fit for purpose for the 21st century. Uh, so what we are actually doing is two things. Um, we're looking at the current duty system, uh, which does include that commitment at 120 hours, uh, and how do we make that uh, as effective as we possibly can. Um, I'll give you a little example. Uh, we were up at Bewley uh, in the Highlands recently, and we were speaking to staff up there, and they were telling us about the unavailability of their uh, yeah. pump uh, during the day. Uh, and they were telling us that there used to be a number of shops in the village, uh, and everybody in each of the shops would commit to come and crew that fire appliance. There's now one national chain that has a shop, uh, and they cannot release the staff. Well, there's quite a few other shops in Bewley. Yes, yeah. uh, that, that, that can uh, release their staff uh, you know, to crew that fire appliance. Uh, and most of the people now work out with the town. They now work out with the town. Uh, so, but they told me uh, of an example of where they had a couple of people that were interested in joining the service, but the whole recruitment process, this was prior to the reform, uh, took more than 12 months. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So by the time they got to that point, people had lost interest. Yeah. So one of the things we've done to make the current system uh, as effective as possible is to streamline all the processes so you will know whether you're getting into the fire service and the retained within a period of two months now. So we've done that, and so we're making that as effective as possible. But what we're also doing is we are making sure that we are looking at what are the options for the future. How would we resign, uh, design a new service if we had a blank piece of paper that would be fit for purpose for now, and that will report by the end of this year? OK. Uh, Colin Beattie, can you we just try and keep our questions and answers as succinct as possible? And Thank you, Vera. Mary Scannell hasn't shown us exactly how to do that, but we can be sure our colleagues can. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Looking at uh, page 29, I'm looking at uh, false alarms. 57% are false alarms, which seems a huge percentage, uh, although I must confess I've contributed a couple of times to that myself. Um, but but the, uh, the number of uh, equipment malfunction uh, elements in there has risen by 5%, although over, overall, in, in this, roughly the same period, it's dropped by 12% the number of false alarms. I'm concerned about the equipment malfunctions increasing as a, as a, as a percentage, and I'm concerned about the 57% that are false alarms. Are we making real progress in, in sorting this out? It's a huge cost to you, especially when you're going through, uh, uh, you know, these cost constraints and reductions that we're all suffering from. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, clearly uh, the number of false alarms that, that, that occur is something that, that, that we want to reduce. Um, most of the cost is actually the anticipatory cost, because most of the uh, stations that are attending these false alarms uh, are in our big cities, you know, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, though they do occur across the rest of the country. So we have uh, the appliances and we have the crews at the stations and the attendees uh, incidents. Um, so there is potential uh, to reduce costs there, but actually uh, it's, it's, it's not so much about reducing uh, direct cost and making financial savings, it's about the opportunity costs because these crews could be engaged in much more meaningful work to drive down risk even further across Scotland. So we have got a big focus uh, on that. What we have done is we've just um, um, recently uh, did a, a piece of research uh, in Glasgow looking at all the false alarms. Uh, we have a business engagement forum uh, within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and we've also invited some other key stakeholders uh, in into this piece of research that we're doing, so we're examining why we're getting so many false alarms. Bear in mind that a fire alarm system is, 
is actually an essential piece of safety equipment. Uh, it does save many lives. If I just say to you that the first alert to the Glasgow School of Art fire came from an automatic fire alarm system. So obviously early detection and alert to the fire and rescue service is something I would strongly encourage. Uh, but some early findings from this research uh, is that many of the systems uh, are perhaps not maintained uh, or managed as effectively as they can be. So we're working with the industry on that. Uh, and actually, there's a predominance of false alarms uh, occurring on systems that are more than a decade uh, old. So what we'd be doing is looking you know, to work with the industry, perhaps work with the regulators, to look at ways in which these type of systems uh, can be refreshed uh, so that they do not give unnecessary calls to the Fire and Rescue Service and thereby you know, making, uh, not allowing us to make best use of what is a, an essential public resource, which is our firefighters on our fire stations. Looking at paragraph 58, it would appear that the estimated costs of false alarms are based on a 2002 figure, so the likely cost is going to be much higher. Would you agree to that? These figures are based on uh, the economic cost of fire. These are figures that are put out by uh, the CLG, uh, and as those uh, figures are uh, updated, um, I, I, I don't actually know when the CLG are going to update this. Uh, I hear that there is work in progress to do that. But of course, since uh, those figures were produced, uh, inflation has, has uh, had an impact on costs. So you would anticipate that it would be uh, higher. So it's not going to be 19, it's probably at least a third more. Yeah. But bear in mind that um, although it's saying £19 million, those are not necessarily cashable savings that we can make because the anticipatory cost, i.e. having the fire station, having the fire appliances and having the staff to respond, they would predominantly be there anyway. It's the, uh, it's the uh, non-cashable savings. It's actually deploying these resources to better effect is where you'd make a real difference. Is there any capability where it's... Uh we have a situation where there are multiple false alarms at the, the same address to actually get reimbursed for these costs? Is there any mechanism to do that? If someone fails, for example, if it's an alarm system that someone fails to maintain or fails to get rectified and you're call, called out on multiple occasions, I would have said there's a justification for making yeah. a charge. Yeah. We, we've looked at that um, and my understanding is that we do not have the power to charge for that. Um, I'm not convinced it's entirely, you know, and I understand the thinking behind that. I'm not convinced it's entirely the right uh, thing to do. It sounds punitive. Um, what we've done, and I can give you a, a, an example uh, from where I live in Dundee, uh, we, we, we often, when new students come into the halls of residence, uh, get multiple false alarms. Uh, this was something we experienced every year. But actually, uh, recognising that pattern, looking at those uh, multiple false alarms and then working with the university authorities on an education and a management pr uh, process, we've seen the number of false alarms being reduced dramatically. So working in partnership, uh, and this is you know, you know, the, the whole thinking behind uh, the project that we're undertaking in Glasgow at the moment, working in partnership is perhaps uh, a better way to address this challenge. My second question uh, really relates to paragraph 55, which is uh, the fact that the number of actual fires have gone down fairly substantially, uh, possibly as a result of home safety visits. Now, yeah. I was quite interested in, in this document here where you're talking about alternative uh, functions for the fire brigade uh, in relation to that, or, or compensating for that. And recently, I've been to to the fire stations in my own area, and they were talking about uh, a, incorporating visits to vulnerable people and so forth, working with the NHS, working with local health boards. Has that been, is, is that a viable way forward? Is that, is that, is that how you're going to uh, sort of uh, weigh the fire brigade in the future? Can I, can I have a big comment first? And obviously the, 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 the Chief will have much more detailed answer. The short answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, I think the likes of the, the, the Fire Brigade, because of its, its brand, its trusted brand, can play a far higher role and a different role um, in many communities throughout Scotland. Remember, we are a fire and rescue service. We're not just a fire service. You know, fire actually plays, you know, like I say, a relatively, although it is a big impact and a tragedy for 
people who are, who are suffering it. In the, in the terms of a day-to-day -day operation of firefighters, it is not their main function. Um, it, is, it is part of the function and part of the role that they play. When it's absolutely needed, it's vital that they have the expertise to deal with it. But we have got a wider role that we can play. We have got a badge that gets us in, you know, where many other badges won't get in. And I'm talking about whether it's police, whether it's ambulance, whether it's health, whether it's social work. And, and we can play a role as a partner with other uh, partnership organisations to actually improve delivery, improve outcomes for communities. But I'll, I'll hand over to the Chief. I'm sorry, it's a hobby horse. <laughs> I think one of the challenges of Christy uh, is that what we all want to do is shift much more to a preventative uh, model. And one of the keys to doing that is through partnership. So we are across uh, the whole of the public sector, incorporating the voluntary sector uh, and, and others. Where can we work in partnership to improve outcomes? And it's not necessarily uh, what your direct responsibility is. You know, is clearly to um, you know, drive in the risk in relation to fires and other emergencies, and then also to respond to these things. But if through that brand or the skill sets that we have, we can deploy that bit to best effect to help uh, other partners meet their uh, outcomes, then we really ought to be doing that. And equally, though the fire service has to take incredible credit for what is a great success story in terms of driving down risk uh, and reducing the number of fire deaths uh, and injuries that are actually occurring within Scotland, we do have to recognise that other partners have made a significant contribution to that. Uh, you know, some of the health education campaigns around healthy eating uh, and stopping smoking ha have a big impact upon our outcomes. Uh, so that partnership work and joining up the resources of the public sector to improve outcomes and not necessarily looking at the obvious ones is something that we in the Fire and Rescue Service are absolutely committed to. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wonder if I could just go back to the questions that Mary Scanlon was asking about the retained service and link them to the convener's points about, uh, about funding. You, you were very open about the cost pressures that you face. Does that have implications as well for the, the redesign of the retained um, service that you were describing in an earlier answer to Mary Scanlon? Do you want me to go for that? I mean, what we need to do when we look at the um, resources that are available to us uh, is deployed them to best effect. And the retained duty system has been cost effective. But one of the um, perverse things about the retained duty system is that people are paid on activity. So the more fires you go to, the more emergencies you go to, the more you reward you. If, if you know, up there, probably our number one aim is prevention within the organisation, who designs a system that rewards? Uh, against your number one aim. Pay and reward systems are surely uh, there to ensure that the organisation meets its aims. Uh, so when we look uh, at the retained duty system, uh, one of the things that we will have to look at is how do we uh, reward, in the wider sense, but financially as well, how do we reward our retained uh, duty staff for what they do within their communities? We have to try and look at availability, making sure that when they're needed, uh, they are available. What we also have to look at is um, how do they commit to doing those community safety type activities because they are the local people uh, within these communities. There's a big challenge around competence within the retained. Uh, I reflect back on a report that was done by uh, the health and safety executive that actually said the biggest single safety issue facing the UK Fire and Rescue Service is the competence of retained duty firefighters. So it's a great thing that there are less operational incidents. Uh, but if we have a competence-based training framework, then what that means is we need to train people more because they're not getting that on-the-job experience that they may have got previously. So we have to make sure uh, that we focus on the competence of our, our, our retained duty firefighters. So those three things uh, will obviously link uh, to a pay and reward, which will obviously then link to uh, the resources, the financial resources that we have uh, available to us to protect people of Scotland. This is a difficult balance, is it not, Chief Officer, in the sense of competence and then experience based on what, you've actually, what our firefighters have actually seen. If there are less incidents, which Colin Beatty has been driving at, which is a, by definition a good thing, yeah. you've got less experience. So it, it's a, it strikes me as a, as a difficult balance to reach in terms of then putting experienced staff to an incident that they therefore are competent to deal with. Yeah. So, so 
it really is uh, one of the challenges that, 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 that we are trying to address here within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and we have the economies of scale and scope yeah. you know, to do that in a way that perhaps some of the antecedent services didn't have. Um, the type of training uh, that we give to our retained uh, firefighters really does need to be focused on risk. Uh, so we have a system in Scotland where there's 46 generic risks. Uh, if you're a whole-time firefighter, we can train you in all 46 over a period of three years. But for our retained firefighters, there's 11 that are you know, common to everybody, uh, but there's eight that are optional. And depending upon the risks that you're likely to attend within your locality, those are the eight that we will focus on okay. uh, to make sure that you're competent in the type of activities that we're going to ask you to, to uh, engage in on behalf of your communities. And then allied to that, uh, because they're not getting the experiential uh, learning that they may have got previously, um, we have to provide realistic training facilities. Uh, there's no reason at all uh, why you cannot uh, develop those competencies mm. if you have an appropriate training programme. So we've got a substantial investment programme across Scotland to make sure that those facilities are accessible to retain firefighters, and that means as close as possible uh, to their communities. Well, the summer training facility is very yeah. realistic. I've done it, and it's uh, frighteningly <laughs> realistic. Um, uh, can, I, can I ask two questions on this? Firstly, I take it that staff have been involved in that process, in the review that you're currently carrying out. And secondly, you said earlier to Mary Scanlon that, the, that it was due to finish in December. Can we assume, therefore, that in 2016, the Fire and Rescue Service will be rolling this, rolling this new model, as you said earlier, out, whatever it's going to be called, and, and however it will be configured? In other words, will staff have certainty in next year, 2016, as to how uh, you envisage the new service being structured? Staff have absolutely been involved in this. Yeah. Uh, although I've been in the fire service for 32 years, I've never worked to retain duty system. Uh, I've always lived in and big cities, uh, being a whole-time firefighter. Um, those that work that system and have all those pressures and challenges of balancing their commitment to the fire service, you know, their other employment or their business, their family lives, they know what it actually means. Mm. So we, we really have to listen to them. Uh, many of the solutions we seek will lie within uh, their experience, their knowledge and their ideas. So the way we've set this project up is we have RDS staff uh, in the project, but we also have a wider range of RDS st staff that act as uh, a sounding board uh, for the whole project. Uh, so listening to them, getting their experiences uh, is absolutely crucial. Um, we're working very closely at the moment uh, in relation to you know, what a redesigned service might look like. Uh, with some of our uh, local authority colleagues. So we're very hopeful that shortly we'll be running a pilot in Aberdeenshire, uh, East Lothian and also Scottish Borders. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, rural mm. uh, areas there that we might test some of our thinking within those areas. So we're hopeful that uh, pilot will be uh, up and running towards the end of this year. Uh, and then the findings of that will feed into our, our wider thinking um, where we've no, not just looked at what happens in the UK, we've looked at some of the Scandinavian models, what's happening in Sweden, in Finland in particular, uh, and we've also done uh, a, a literature review from around the world, particularly focusing on New Zealand, who nationalised their fire service in the 90s. Uh, it was previously set up like the UK, uh, had RDS, and they've taken a particular route, increasing volunteers. So, um, learning all these lessons, running some pilots, uh, will um, hopefully then be in a place next year uh, to begin mm. uh, reforming it and begin an action plan to deliver a new look RDS system. That's what we're aspiring to. Thank you for that. Can I ask one very final question? You mentioned, uh, Chief Officer, the Christie report earlier on uh, in the context of, of efficiencies and saving money. Presumably that includes co-location. So the one I'm obviously thinking about is Lerwick, where you've got a very sensible plan to co-locate with the ambulance service. That presumably saves money for both. Um, organisations, and um, do I take it that's part of a wider plan? I take it Lerwick's going ahead, and that's part of a wider kind of plan you've got across Scotland. Yeah, I, mean, and, I mean, certainly there's, there's some excellent examples that, uh, on the ground right now where it's getting co-location. Um, the one you're talking about is co-location with the ambulance service, but we'll actually get triple location with police, fire and ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, we have got um, a, a committee set up of the, the chairs of 
um, myself from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, the Chair of Police and the Chair of Ambulance Service, where we meet on a regular basis to discuss how we move forward together. Um, we have got several projects on the ground at the present time. We're looking at um, different options where we can actually um, work together and do that at early intervention to, to see we're looking at where, we, where have we got major projects? Who's got the major projects? Can we all fit into that? Can we do something differently that delivers better on the ground and actually is more efficient than what we're doing at the present time? And that's an ongoing process, and that committee meets every three months. They actually update each other, and we have regular meetings with our officers to, to talk us through how we're going to take that forward. But okay. Alison might have other examples. Thank you. Um, I mean, like others, we should congratulate the, the chair and the farm or the chief officer is, uh, on the success that, that's demonstrated in the report. But um, in relation to um, you know where we started on this, you know, towards forty-three million pound figure that Audit Scotland identify as the as a potential funding gap, is, is that a wake-up call to the fire service in Scotland about the degree of challenge you may face in the future? No. It's not comfortable knowing the, 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 the possibility of that. As you say, it's a projection, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to get the scenarios in place that we can actually deal with that. You know, if that, we should plan for the worst and hope for the best. Okay. Um, but, you know, is, is it comfortable to know the possibility that I'm? No, it's not. Um, was that a figure that was in your own heads in terms of your own planning before Audit Scotland presented it to you? No, it wasn't. No. Why was that? Well, we had, we had done the projections, as, as I think the Chief Officer um, indicated earlier on. Um, when we were doing our initial projections, um, we were looking at, as it has been indicated, that we were getting a flat cash settlement. We then looked at what would happen if we had a 5% reduction in our cash, and we have got the critical savings plan to actually develop into that. That would take us to £20 million, um, of, of a shortfall. Um, if we look at the projection that's now been made by uh, Audit Scotland, we will then have to look about how we get that. Mm -hmm. But we have got a long-term savings plan in place, a long-term projection in place, mm -hmm. and it's not taken into account that, that higher sum. But obviously we will have to sit down and look at that and see how, what, what that would, would deliver for us in the future. I mean, presumably, it, I, I appreciate it's not a figure that you would uh, you would want to accept, but it is a, a figure that you do accept. That uh, it, so, in terms of a, a report that you produce for March next year, you will set out in that report how you would seek to, to address a, a funding a funding gap of that level. That would be one, be one probably of amongst one of the options yeah. that, you, that you'd present. So that that will you know you can give us that assurance. You would contain yes. that in, in March yes. 2016. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I wouldn't use the language of a wake-up call for the Fire and Rescue Service, but I do think it's a, it's a, it's a very important recommendation by the Auditor-General, and I think it's timely. Um, I hope you would understand that uh, in bringing about uh, the Single Fire and Rescue Service, our, our biggest focus was on business continuity, making sure that we continue to deliver uh, our prevention and emergency response services. It is not an insignificant challenge uh, also to merge uh, effectively nine organisations because also the college became part of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service into one. And that has taken uh, a significant amount of uh, time, effort and energy and focus off mm -hmm. our staff. Uh, and we had done uh, some long-term financial forecasting uh, using our critical uh, savings pathway where we feed in uh, all the ways in which we can potentially uh, reduce the cost base of the organisation whilst at the same time protecting uh, frontline service delivery. However, the robustness with which you need to do that has been pointed out, I think, extremely well by the Auditor-General. Uh, and although we have all the components uh, to do that, to feed into our critical savings pathway, to do it in the way that is suggested in here, I think will be extremely important uh, to ensure the long-term success uh, of the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I think, I think you have res responded to what the Auditor-General said in a, a very honest and way that I think Makes, makes clear that the focus is, is on all of us um, to think about what the impact of that would be in terms of the public's expectations of the service um, and the, the, other, the other pressures that um, are on you. I mean, do you think... Uh, I, I, I suppose I'll leave that point there. I'll maybe just return briefly, um, Paul, to the uh, convener, sorry, to the, um, the question that uh, Mary Scanlon was asking around absence um, levels. If I understood the Chief Officer correctly, you were saying that that was a function of... 
um, different levels within the previous uh, eight services. Um, and you were driven by the, the best performance, I think, in terms of where you then put, put the national target. What's the degree of difference um, across the predecessor uh, authorities? What, you know, is the, how close together are they? What are the outliers? Uh, and are they continuing um, in the new service? Yeah. Um, the variation um, was quite marked, actually, between the different services. Uh, and it's also quite marked within different staff staff groups mm -hmm. uh, within the organisation. Uh, so clearly we seek to understand um, why there was a variation and also why there is differences within different uh, staff groups. Uh, and that has been the basis on which we have uh, produced our new attendance management policy uh, looking at best practice, not just within the service, but also out with and 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 you know, sympathetic and supportive uh, procedures that, that, that actually uh, um, would enable that policy to improve <coughs> attendance um, within the service. So there has been some considerable uh, variety previously. We've sought to understand why that is and to learn the lessons so we can improve attendance in a supportive way going forward. Mm. But you, could, let me just... Um, just finally on this uh, convener, but just to, could you maybe just elaborate what some of those drivers might be? I mean, is it areas, it forces that are maybe more dependent upon RDS than others, forces <coughs> where they're in you know, rural versus urban areas, or um, yeah. you know, there have been other management issues in, the, in that particular service, or what, what are these drivers? Yeah. Um, the difference isn't uh, based on uh, rurality or, or, or urban. That's something that, mm. that, that isn't one of the major factors. Um, some of the major factors, though, um, have been around um, how much priority has been put on good attendance by the Fire and Rescue Service, what types of uh, supportive mechanisms such as occupational health have underpinned uh, you know, a, you know, uh, a successful um, return to work. It's all of that type of stuff. That's where the variety lay within the antecedent services. And those are the things that we've looked where that's been working well in a cost-effective way. We've brought that into the new policies and procedures of the new service. Okay. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, gents, uh, in, it's been reported that in July there's going to be a, an emergency budget by the UK government. Uh, and as a consequence, the, the, there will be, uh, I'd imagine, there will be some consequences to, uh, to the Scottish budget, whether uh, positive or negative. So I, I would assume, therefore, that, uh, that yourselves uh, would certainly look at that particular budget and, uh, and potentially reassess your own financial uh, implications for the coming uh, year and potentially uh, further years. Absolutely. Um, you know, we take a keen interest uh, in all the decisions that are made both within the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament uh, in relation to what budgets are and the priorities within uh, those budgets. Um, you know, we, of course, we put over a strong case for the effectiveness of the Fire and Rescue Service and the wider contribution that it makes, but we do recognise that the, the importance of things like uh, you know, the budget set by the Chancellor at a UK level, and we will try and you know, see what that, the implications are in terms of decisions made there uh, are for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and feed that into our financial planning and strategies. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I would assume that uh, you would make, um, you'd be making some, uh, uh, you, you would contact, no doubt, the Scottish Government uh, to potentially raise uh, your, your issues or, or thoughts or concerns as a, as a consequence of this yeah. budget. Yeah. Can I say that we mean that certainly we meet the minister on a regular basis. Um, we meet the minister once a month um, to discuss issues, and we get an agenda for that. And it was through those meetings we would would raise any concerns that we had or any support that we were looking for um, from the government. And the minister today has been very, very supportive. Uh, in paragraph uh, 69 uh, of the report, uh, it touches upon <coughs> uh, the example. Uh, of, uh, of the, the discussions with the uh, Scottish Ambulance Service, and the, so in terms of, kind of across uh, Scotland, I mean, I know some of this was touched upon earlier. Uh, what other challenges or opportunities are there uh, in working with other parts of the public sector? Uh, not, so not just the ambulance service, but the whole kind of range of the public sector uh, to develop potentially uh, further shared uh, shared. Uh, 
their approaches to responding to emergencies. I'm up with an, and hand over to the Chief Officer, who, who's probably got um, more on overall um, look at this. I mean, certainly there is opportunities for us, undoubtedly, um, across the, the whole of the public sector to work better with partner organisations to develop it. If we look at, for instance, our, um, our stats at the present time, um, I know that in a, a recent committee that we, we reported that um, out of the, the deaths that's happened in Scotland, I think it's 10 or 11 has been fire suicides. Um, that would indicate that we need to work better with health to understand why that's happening, um, to, to try and prevent that, if it's possible, in the future, to look about, you know, like, say, various areas. If you look at the, the rest of the fire statistics, it's changed dramatically in the sense that more and more elderly people are living at home um, on their own, maybe coming out of care, maybe getting support from other care organisations, um, but they're the most vulnerable people um, in the community at the present time. And we need to be working better with our partners in local government and in the care sector to ensure, and, and health as well, to know that where people are vulnerable, that we're aware of it and can, can lend our support to ensure that they are best protected um, as possible. So there's areas that we can we can work on. There's areas we need to do in partnership. If it was, you know, if one service could do this all on their own, you know, like it would have been done. Um, but it takes partnership working um, and to do that that early intervention and, and, and protection of, of people. But I'll hand over to the chief officer. Um, as a national service, it does give us the opportunity, uh, you know, to, to deliver economies of scale and economies of scope. Um, but what we can never forget is that the vast majority of our services where we make a, di a difference are delivered at a very local level uh, and are delivered often in, in, in partnership with other public uh, agencies uh, and the third sector and indeed the private sector. So what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't limit uh, the type of partnership activities that we could get involved in. Uh, we have a lot of uh, core skills. We know what our core responsibilities are. Uh, but those skills that we have uh, are, are very transferable to help uh, partners achieve their outcomes. We're focused on um, making a contribution in the most effective way we can to all 16 uh, national outcomes. I think maybe just to highlight uh, this out of hospital cardiac um, arrest strategy that's been developed here within Scotland and it's at the end of the report. Scotland has the unenviable record of being amongst uh, the lowest in terms of survival rates in Europe. It's around about 4%. Uh, the best in Europe uh, are up at you know, 34 35%. And we've got examples from uh, North America uh, where it's pushing 40%. Uh, so the ambition is to save 1,000 lives. Um, in that report we spoke about earlier, the economic cost of fire, it puts... Um, the cost of a, a fire death at £1.6 million. Pounds. That's the societal cost. Um, if you can put a cost against such things, it seems crass at times, but people do. Um, so £1.6 million, save a 1,000 lives. That is a significant uh, saving to the Scottish economy that the Fire and Rescue Service can make a difference to. And we attended a very successful uh, launch of this strategy, a symposium, uh, just along uh, the road there in George Street in Edinburgh. And there was a, a, presenta a presentation done by uh, Seattle Fire Service, who were invited over by Scottish uh, Government, because they have survival rates of 40%. Uh, and the title of uh, their presentation uh, was The Fire and Rescue Service, A Game Changer. So if you can harness the capacity of an organisation like ours, which has a network of stations and an, and an ability to put people on the ground quicker than any other organisation in significant numbers, you can make a difference that could mean in Scotland we can save 1,000 lives. And if you want to put a cost on that, 1,000 times £1.6 million is a significant saving, not just the moral responsibility we have to save lives. So partnership working... <coughs> Improving outcomes don't limit the opportunities, but there are some obvious ones that we will focus on, such as this out of hospital cardiac arrests. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, just keep focused and mm -hmm. questions and answers. Sorry. But, uh, so, I mean, well, the example that, uh, with examples actually you just uh, provided, uh, sound like yet uh, another reason 
uh, to, to justify obviously what's happened. And certainly in paragraph 13 of the report that we heard earlier on regarding the, the previous joint boards, uh, and th the wording that was used at the time uh, was that the, the joint boards they weren't, they were, they were poorly supported. Now, uh, after what you just said there as well, it sounds like um, certainly the decision that's happened and the changes that have happened uh, are certainly going to provide yourselves with an even greater opportunity to actually have that joint working, even though the joint boards were there beforehand but clearly weren't working and weren't actually delivering uh, these uh, wider opportunities that, that, that you just highlighted. I maybe come in. I mean, I'm 30 years uh, an elected member at local level. I was never a great fan of joint boards. I think it, uh, it watered down the effect on this and how you delivered. Um, did I have the answer on what should replace it? No, it didn't. Um, are we better placed to have more people involved and to, to see more elected representatives involved in, in what we're doing? Absolutely we are. Can I tell you that since local, when local government reorganisation happened and it took place in 1990, 1996, and I, I stepped down from local government in 2012, I was yet to hear a report from our representatives and either police or fire at my authority. Between being appointed the chair of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in September 2012 until we took over in April 2013, I made inquiries against other authorities that had joined were part of a joint board. There were two that weren't joint boards. That was fighting to Brees and Galloway. Very few had the report back from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, which means that the people that were involved in it were very, very limited. For instance, if I take you to North Lanarkshire today, our LSO and our member, if we go there, reports to 16 elected members. They had five on the board. And that 16 report directly to the council on what the interaction has been. So the, we have a much wider involvement in, in, in from elected members at the present time. You know, and they have, they, they, they have got the right to scrutinise the delivery of service in their area and to make sure that we are actually delivering on the joint plan that we have jointly agreed on for delivering within, within their area. And that is just one example. You know, there are many examples. We cannot tell authorities how they are going to do that scrutiny. They, they, they have adopted it to suit their, their purpose. But have we got a better system just now? We have met every single authority over the past two years, and many of them more than once, and not one has told told us that the interaction today with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is worse than it was before. It's actually improved a lot of that down to the legislation and the LSOs working on the ground with that authority individual, individually, but also uh, board members and other officers uh, being committed to making sure that it does work. There's a real commitment to making sure that this works, and a lot of it is down to the commitment of our staff, right from the chief officer down to you know cleaners and stations and everyone in between. Myself, thank you. Official report, LSO. Lead officer, local lead officer. Okay. Lo local senior. It's local senior officer. Okay. Uh, Nigel Don. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much, convener. I think actually most of the questions that I wanted to ask as follow-ups have actually been asked, but, but I, I would just like simply to put on record that I, as it happens last Friday, I came across a, a very serious accident in my constituency, took the opportunity of stopping and talking to some of the staff. But the point I'd simply make is I was sufficiently affected by what I saw that I actually changed what I did that morning on the basis that the meeting I thought I was going to, I probably wasn't going to contribute to as I might have done. And I merely reflect that if that's the experience of your staff every day of the week, then I think we actually have to bear in mind that they work in quite trying circumstances. And I think your comments earlier are much appreciated. Uh, Colin Keir. Thank you, <coughs> you convener. Uh, good afternoon there. Um, just really one question I'd really like to ask, and it's, uh, I don't think you've um, been asked that. I hope it hasn't, anyway, but I've certainly, I must have missed it otherwise. But it's dealing with the issues around uh, paragraph 26 and the control room closures. And um, it's really just a case of, I know we have a couple of paragraphs here that are talking about it, but perhaps uh, you could just expand a little bit to you know, maybe a review of how far you got, what you've actually found so far, and, and the judgment on the actual closures as well as the performance rates of these offices. 
by the chief officer. In. I mean, certainly we have um, we have reflected on on what we have done. Um, at the present time, there's been one closure of uh, a control room and merged into another control room. Um, that was in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, it was closed quicker than the rest because of the the condition of the equipment in the, in the control room. The manufacturers had told us that they could not guarantee repair. They actually not only told us that, but they told the previous authority that as well, that they could not guarantee repair because it was so outdated and so old. So we had to do something to ensure that that was, that was working properly. Um, I, if I was looking back on what, we'd done, what we had done, probably when we took the initial, the initial decision, and that was in, uh, it was in September 2013, um, about how we took forward our, our control room programme, um, I think that the, the major fault that we had in that was that we did not maybe have enough discussion um, and with, the, with the authorities that were going to be affected by that change that was going to be made. And, and I freely admit that. And, and I think we've, we've tried to take steps to, to ensure that that happens. The actual merger of the Dumfries and Galloway control room with the Johnson control room, uh, uh, which was the former Strathclyde uh, control room, um, went absolutely seamlessly. Absolutely seamlessly. It was, it was a fantastic exercise. Myself and the Chief Officer met all the staff in, in Dumfries and Galloway on more than one occasion, um, explained to them what the options are, what we could try and do, how we would try and manage that process, how we would get the knowledge transferred and how we would manage it. I think there, in, in this year we have probably got two further control rooms, the one at Madison and Thornton will be merged into. We have just refurbished the, the Edinburgh control room, um, which when that's completed, we will merge the, the uh, Madison and Thornton control rooms into the Edinburgh control room. And, and we would hope that that would be absolutely seamless as well. The transfer will not happen if we're not confident that that will happen. And so if you were asking me to look back and, and what we could have done better, Initially, when we took the decision, we could have actually been uh, more in contact with the organisation about the impact of that, particularly with local authorities. Uh, but with the, the actual transfer itself has went absolutely seamlessly, and we have no uh, indication that, that, that what we're doing in the future will make it happen. Surely. But we will have further discussion with organisations. Okay. Can I thank Mr Waters and Mr Hay for your time this morning? Uh, could I uh, move to agenda item number five? which is a further response from the Scottish Government to the committee's report entitled uh, Report on Reshaping Care for, the, for Older People. Uh, can I ask members for comments? Just ask your colleagues if they would wish to note the report. Is that agreed? Okay. Uh, agenda item number six. Can I move the committee into private session? As agreed.